Hey friends, welcome back. This is Virtual Dev Intersection. This is a show where we're going to talk about all the cool new things that are going on in the world of development that are important to you as developers. My name is Jeff Fritz, and I'm joined by my co-host, the Richard Campbell. Yeah, here I am, and uh, the, doing something weird this time. I'm actually still up on the coast, you know, I'm, I'm resisting the idea that summer has ended. Okay. So I, I tweeted out a picture today of the rig I've brought up with the XC10 and two screens stacked, and uh, it's it's fun. It's working pretty good, but we have a chance of uh, seagulls or sea lions making racket around here, and uh, we'll we'll see what happens. And very natural light. Very natural light. Oh my gosh, the the lighting that you have there at, at the at the place is amazing. And of course, you're on the east coast, right? You're you're on the, the no no no. You're on the east coast, the proper coast, the coast that all the, New York is here, Philadelphia is here. No. <laughs> not at all. No, of course not. You know, uh, I, you know who was visiting me uh, in the springtime was Paul Thorot. Oh, okay. And he and his wife came up, stayed for a few days before we uh, went on to another event. And, uh, you know, I think East Coast people don't understand how long sunsets take on the West Coast. No, we don't. Sunsets into the ocean on this side, right? So a sunset here is about two hours. Okay. That's, and so that's you know, a long the time. sun was just started to dip down and everything started changing color. You know, Paul took a nice picture for his Instagram. It's like, wow, what a fantastic sunset on the West Coast. And I'm like, dude, you, a little early. You know, half an hour later and it's gone all pinky and orange. He's like, holy man, this is one of the best sunsets I've ever seen. And then a half hour after that, he took another one and it had gone sort of purpley and, and blue. And then a half oh. hour after that, like, oh, for crying out loud. And yeah. Half, yeah, you know, um, definitely something to be said about uh, how long that is. And at least the the little bit that I've seen of the sunsets when I'm in Seattle, right? Mm -hmm. Very nice. I'm looking forward to when I get to visit San Diego and what it's like there in Southern California. Oh, yeah, you got TwitchCon coming up, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's right after .NET Conf. I go from one to the other. Right. And uh, I'm actually, I'm more worried about TwitchCon than I am .NET Conf. <laughs> .NET Conf, I've, I've done this a number of times. We know how this works. Well, you've got an amazing team for .NET Conf, too, right? I mean, the yes. group is huge. There's lots of good news coming. So it's, yeah. in some ways, it is easier. Yeah. With Twitch, you're, you're kind of leading the pack in this stuff, in, in what development on Twitch. It's, it's interesting. Can you do me a favor? Can you stop and restart your camera? It looks like the camera froze. Oh, great. Let's see how we're going to do that. I might have to drop the call entirely, right? Uh, see if just the camera button in Skype will flip that over for us. Okay. Let me see if that, we'll try that first. Because I've, I've seen that work for some folks. Well, there's three cameras rigged here, too. <laughs> just a yep. few. Just a, as you do. Portable studios. That's what we've got here. Yeah. There it is. All right, over to the Skype, and there, we're back. Uh, hey, yeah, you were right. All right. You're so clever. I might have done this once or twice. Yeah, not your first rodeo. Like, and like I was saying, like you kind of are breaking ground here with uh, the development on Twitch. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, it's there. There's something that's that's magical. That's that's very intimate about this medium, where um, you know that that viewers are just a few inches from from your face, right? They're if, if, when folks are watching here, they're either watching on their desktop, they're watching maybe on their phone or on a tablet. The number of folks who watch on a big screen TV are few and far between. You know, yeah, there's a lot of folks that, that do that with other things on Twitch, but when they're watching this type of content, they're really close. So as a medium, you really are talking directly to someone. And if you embrace that and you think about it like that intimate talk radio experience, which I, I learned so much watching and listening to uh, .NET Rocks recordings, mm -hmm. there is, it, it, if you talk to folks genuinely and, and you get excited when you get that right feedback from folks or you talk about something and you figure out, you know, or and you, you go in a new direction, get excited, be genuine and share that. Yeah. Well, and I, I saw this happen on your stream just before we started this, right? You cracked that Jason problem you've been wrestling with for how many days? Oh, my gosh. It was two or three days. You know, a couple <laughs> hours worth of, of coding. And it's like, right, we, we, we openly, we Googled for things. We binged for things. We duck, duck, goad for things. It looked on Stack Overflow. And nobody had a good solution for this. And finally, somebody in chat said, wait a sec. 
did you put the serializer settings here on this call? And it worked. I'm like, oh right. my gosh. So yeah. it's, it's 99% diagnostics, 1% coding. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. It's not, it, it's not who you know or what you know. It's how fast can you find what you need? And, and, and Aaron, like, like, I remember when we'd find something like that, then you write the blog post mm. where you, you've got to describe the problem in detail. So that's what gets indexed, right? Especially if you've got a sp particular error code. Yeah. I mean, to this day, every so often I search for a particular error code and get my own blog post back. Yes. <laughs> the, oh my oh, gosh. Yeah, I figured this out it six isn't... years ago. Right. And I mean, that's something for, for you as viewers, right? You're, you're going to be writing down, Hey, look at these things that I figured out. You're going to go through and, and have these things that, that you discover and be like, Oh my gosh, that was such a big help. That was really neat. What I figured out. And, and you want, you want to tell your colleagues, you want to tell the, the person sitting across from you, the, your teammates that are, that are working with you, look what I solved in stand up. You know, this, this is what we did. Don't just tell them, write it down. Yeah. And if you if you write it down in a OneNote or uh, you know whatever your notebook of choice might be, that's great. You'll be able to search and find that. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> put it on a blog. Put it on dev.to. Write it up, and you might get not just the ability to search and find it later, but the other thing that I've seen, Richard, is people will respond to your blog post and, and give you ways to take it to the next level. Yeah, or you, there's this tool now that makes that easier, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Open source. I'm, uh, carry I'm kind of amazed that it's still, I still feel like the blog's the best tool for that because it's something you know that Google's going to reliably index. Sure. You know, and, I, I wish there was something better. But it, it seems to me today when I'm going and looking to solve problems, the most rely, and I can describe it well, yeah. I'm only going to two places. I'm going to Stack Overflow or I'm finding a, a random blog post. A, a random blog post, and you know Google's going to put that in their not just search index, but it's going to be right in the in their search cache. Right. So you'll be able to look at the state of the page when that thing was indexed. So that's interesting, also to be able to have hanging out there. Yeah, it's, it is interesting to think about how we find these things. Well, here's the other question, and this is probably good for you as as a Microsoft person. It's like. Is this stuff that could end up in docs? Because any of us can end, edit docs now, right? It's all just, it's just a Git repository. It, it is, so yeah. Is there a way for us to take those little tricks and things and make sure they're associated with the right item in docs? That's a real good question. I don't know. I, I was saying this the other day to, on, to my chat, on my channel, that it's one thing to actually show, you know, here's what all the different APIs are and what these properties and methods do inside of a class. But there used to be a segment when it was MSDN documentation of right. ways usage patterns, right? To yep. have an extra section there that is tips or something like that would be really And they're really typically written, written by people outside of Microsoft too. I mean, there was the PMP guys and they were pretty good. But every PMP guy I ever got to know worked with a team of external architects too that were like hey here's how we're actually building stuff in the field yeah the the docs team's real it, real diverse group lots of folks that have seen all kinds of different things there mm -hmm. and you're right to to have those those folks be able to get feedback from the community of usage patterns would be real nice to see yeah in docs. it's an interesting aspect of docs i think maybe we need to explore further yeah well, have you looked at the show lineup? What do you think? I think we're going to be... Pretty close to finalizing that schedule now. We're, we're real close to finalizing the schedule you're talking about for Dev Intersection, not this this the, this show. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're um, still hanging out some episodes around this, but, but it, it helps that we have the schedule together for you know, what we're going to talk about and what we're going to highlight. Yeah, I think we're really close um, on a couple... We have a couple of Microsoft folks that we need to lock down with, with all the rush up to... .NET Conf. Folks have been busy and we're trying to make sure we have the right people lined up for that event. Um, and I'm just keeping an eye on things here for our guest to be coming along in just a few minutes. I don't see it yet. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very distracted as I'm trying to lock down a couple things here. Right. Oh, nice. Uh, 
Have you heard from Kathleen? Yes. Okay, good. Yep. Then I won't pester her. So, um, it, it's telling her that she can't sign in to Skype. Well, that's because Skype loves you. Skype, it's the application that loves you back. Mm hmm. Uh, no. So, as somebody who does video a lot, what I've started thinking through is is there a place instead of doing a blog post for something, if mm -hmm. I figure something out, just open up OBS and record 10 minutes of myself real quick and post it out on YouTube. Right. Like, hey, this thing that we just did today, I'm going to take like five minutes, 10 minutes, record that and put it out there as a highlight on YouTube. Check this out. Write a little blog post that goes with it. You know, here's what we figured out. If you want to do this type of thing, this is what works. Right. And... You know, because video is my medium, I can generate that five-minute video in, you know, seven minutes, including setup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but in there lies the real question, which is, are you quick enough that you can make that routine? I mean, when you, back when I was writing a lot of blog posts on a routine basis, you know, you always had a copy of Live Writer around. You're always making some notes for, you know, this post or that post. You'd get an idea and go, oh, I'll make that another post. Yeah, these days most of that stuff lives in OneNote for me because it's mm. turning into podcasts and conference sessions. And it's real easy to search. That OneNote has yeah. a great search across it. Our friend Carrie Payette in chat makes a very good point. Azure Media Services can index the speech. Um, it can and do the transcription. The challenge there is it takes a really long time to do that indexing. When you say. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we need the text version of all of the words of audio and video really to be indexable long term. It's oh, just yes. a question of how long it takes, how accurate it is, and then how well once it is indexed, it points back to the original media. You know what? I I forgot to turn on closed captioning here for us. Let me turn this on real quick. There we go. I think that should be working. You should start getting closed captions there, chat room. Yeah, as long as we're actually talking, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, let me see. I, for some reason, it's telling me I have three different mixers coming through here. But it, absolutely, we want transcription coming out, right? That makes things accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. But it's also a question of, is the transcript accurate enough that we're... You know, we used to transcribe every .NET Rocks episode back in the old days, and it actually went away for a while. Now we're looking at the new ways to do it. And the biggest problem we had was the technical terms. The things that everyone would search on is the thing that was the hardest to get the transcription right on. Yes. Yes. So uh, I look at, right, so the transcript that we have, not transcript, the closed captioning that you see coming across, that's a live chat transcript coming out of, uh, it's actually coming off of Google. We're bouncing right. off of their voice services to do this. Um, there is a way to extract that from the video. And, right, if we take that extract, put it somewhere, and be able to analyze and go find some of those terms that you know it's not getting right. Yeah. Right? Then you're just transcribing 5%. Right? Yeah, you're fixing, you're fixing the issues. And I, and I do like how a lot of these transcription services have confidence levels. Yes, you can sort of go, you know, give me the five percent that you have the lowest confidence on, and let's see what we've got. Yeah. It's just, it's still hard, and it's not real in time. Like I, I like that we have captioning, but the captioning is only so good. It's the longer process ones that are more accurate. It is. Um, and using Azure Media Services, I tried that with one of my videos, and that's nineteen twenty ten eighty. That's high def, and I've and I shoot at sixty frames a second. That's and this is 60 frames a second as well that you're seeing here. Um, that takes a real long time for it to parse. That's a lot of data that that the cloud is uh, chunking through there, analyzing and trying to report back on. So uh, part of me thinks, well, do I download, do I set up a 720p version, right? Because Twitch will downscale, it'll downsample. And right. send that over and let that and do the analysis on that because it's the same content. Yeah, my only concern is always code legibility, right? Like, sure, but for generating I, the audio transcripts, yeah, right? I guess it doesn't really matter as long as you can move the transcripts across to the higher res file in the end. Yeah, heck, yeah. turn it all the way down, like just 
you know, make it as light as possible if you're just going to pull the audio off of it. Sure. Gordon Howe says you screen cap screen dumps like Michael Washington does, or do you mean screen dumps? Do you mean screen captures? He does great screen captures in his blog posts. He does. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean th that's nice having screen captures, but video, video is where it's at. I like me some video. Yeah, we know. We definitely oh do. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm gonna start. People are gonna start calling me Captain Video, like Red Roger Nielsen. Back yeah, in no, the day. Pretty sure the the purple sequin jacket's going to be the main grab there, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Okay, there's a thing there with the purple sequin jacket. If you haven't seen it, yes, I'm, I have a purple sequin jacket. It was my blazer blazer. Nice. And I, I was sitting talking to, um, to, to Charlotte, mm -hmm. the, the head of... Uh, Charlotte Yarconi. Charlotte Yarconi. Yeah. from Microsoft and uh, that was a thing that was definitely a uh, an experience I don't well, think you, she knew um, the stream you did with us for the .NET Rocks episode that comes out next week yes Chalk and Blazor sure Carl actually set up uh, a DNS entry now so if you go to blazor.netrocks.com you really? get an access feed of all the Blazor shows oh that's nice oh that's very nice and I mean, we talked about this on on the show we did with you, but I mean, we have the entire Blazer history, I think, captured there, starting with we were at NDC Oslo when when Steve Sanderson, I think, blindsided everybody a little bit with the prototype that would oh, become Blazer, yeah. and just said, you know, I was looking at this WebAssembly thing, and I found this Fongy version, open source version of C Sharp that compiles down to C, and da 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 da, -da. and this is running in the this is C Sharp running in the client in the browser, and we're all like. What? Yeah, You're what? kidding, what? right? <laughs> oh my goodness! It's a, it's some of the things that I mean, right? Steve thinks so far outside the box. Yeah, I, I don't think he even knows that there is a box that the yeah, rest of us live in. Sanderson. Yeah, but I mean, from knockout onward, he's like everything the guy works on. Not only have we made a show about it, but you just have to pay attention to it because it's an exploration of the edges of our industry. Oh my that, gosh! Yes. Uh, that that is going to become something. Yeah. Although it's taken a long time to commit to Blazor. I, I find that interesting. Like just trying to find the way forward and where web assembly is really going to live. Yeah. You know, there's gosh. Um, I think a bit of that challenge is a little, a little concern around where right. Apple and the phone manufacturers decided, you know, we're not going to support flash. Everybody's using flash for this, that, and the other thing. We're not going to support flash and we're going to force something else. Well, well <clears throat> there was a good reason for that. Sure. The real, I mean, the re if Flash hadn't been such a terrible piece of software, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the reality, of course, is that the thoughts on Flash letter from Jobs comes out the month after he announces the iPad. And the reality was that Flash was murdering the iPad battery. Like, you could watch it go down. <laughs> and... But, but the other points he made about whitelisting and so forth, like keeping machines safer, they they were all valid points. And HTML5 had been coming for a while. Yes. And you remember when the, when the iPhone first came out in 2007, he said, if you're going to program for the iPhone, you're going to do it in Safari. Yeah. I mean, he was anticipating HTML5's dominance in 2007. And then, of course, they jailbroke the phone. It's like, no, nah, we're going to have to release that code and all those other tools and to deal with all of that, which is not elegant, but it was just the ultimate solution. So then, you know, fast forward when the big iPhone is around, he makes the point about Kill and Flash, which, of course, was the death knell for Silverlight 2. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not going to run uh, for iOS, for better or worse. Yeah, and, but... Uh, and here we are. Here we are, HTML5-based apps... Fuel Snable in chat says, now I use Slack to murder my battery. Yeah. And to be clear, you're, you're using Electron to murder your battery. And Electron is a great battery murderer. Uh, it's very good at that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and not the least of which being, you've got, I mean, how many copies of Chrome have you actually got running in the background right now that all represent either a uh, an accidental, I clicked on OK for notifications because it's never OK. Oh, yes. And <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, where where is the fly that just says always say no to that? Right? And then the and then it's instances of electron. 
and they're they're all beasts. So I, I'm running OBS here, of course, to broadcast. And what you yeah. see, the background that you see around Richard and I, that's actually a browser back there that's broadcasting, and it's got an image with the holes in it, and it's got the nameplates and all that stuff. That's actually a browser. So I've got Chromium embedded inside of what we're broadcasting. And every time there's another widget that we put on screen, that's another Chromium browser. So OBS becomes quite quite the memory hog when you start yeah. broadcasting and you have all these things that you light up. I mean, I'm optimistic now that Microsoft's soft owns electron effectively i mean i know that github is a wholly owned subsidiary but clearly there's going to be some serious microsoft minds oh, yes. paying attention to electron because in terms of utilization of compute like if you love performance tuning any hour you could put in performance tuning of electron is going to have impact on more computers like i think you could actually measure the positive environmental impact you'd have on the world by <laughs> performance of electron. How much electricity are you saving in the yeah. world because you shaved a couple cycles? A are electrons. Yeah. Right. Because we're all we're all running it. Like we're running many copies of it. And it, it it's not particularly efficient. There's there's also something to be said for memory management in JavaScript applications that are inside of Electron, right? Yeah. So I, now, I mean, now, you're, now you're doing the the inception thing, right? Oh it's my like, gosh, yes. Yeah, I have an instance inside of an instance of an instance. All I know for sure is the one in the sen in the all the way in running really slowly. <laughs> That's but, what I know for sure. But I mean, there's something that could be said for better garbage collection of those JavaScript instances the Electron app is hosting, right? So that you aren't just devouring memory like it's going out of style. I, I do feel like we're we're leaking memory like crazy these days. Yes. The difference is we have 32 or 64 gigs in our machines, and so you can leak memory for like a month. But, so... I mean, I keep trying to run Canary, but after two or three days of running Canary, even with one browser instance open, that's two gigs of RAM. Are you referring yeah. to Edge Canary? The Edge Canary, yeah. Okay. I run that one regularly, yes. Yeah. So... And it's got its problems, and it gets updated re regularly. But the number of times I'm like, what's going on? And you pop open uh, uh, Task Manager, and it's like, ah, oh, 60% of RAM is consumed, and four of it is Canary. Yeah. Yeah. There's something to be said for... It'd be great to have a JavaScript uh, runtime that would uh, allow you to compress and catch those memory leaks, because it's really bad at it. Yeah, and I, I, who knows are we, what's actually leaking? Like, I've yet to see anybody give me a decent diagnostic. Is it is it assets that are not being cleared up? Is it runaway instances? Like, I just don't know. Well, and Where's Mark Rasinovich when you need him? Where is Mark Rasinovich? <laughs> um, well, I, we don't have a sound effect for Mark Rasinovich? You know Mark Rasinovich. We've got a sound effect for him. He makes everything better. That's right. That's very good. Um, fuel Snable, that's exactly the point, and, and that's a very good point. You don't need to worry about memory management with JavaScript because they expect you to just reload the page. Yeah, well, that's the way it was for the longest time. Then this spa thing came along. I blame Gmail. <laughs> you blame Google. I see how this works. Well, we, I mean, we could blame uh, Outlook Web Access because they kind of started all of this, but nobody sure. uses that now, really. Um, no, Outlook Web Access is actually really good as a web application. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely the reference app, and historically, it's like this is the beginning of Ajax and all yeah. those sorts of things. But yeah, if you're gonna blame the average mortal knowing about a spa, Gmail, Gmail, yeah, and it it's Gmail's awesome, but the yeah the way it manages memory, when it, you it say does run away. Awesome. <laughs> I've been using it for. 12 years? 15 years? Yeah, yeah, that's not awesome. That's taken for granted. Yeah, it is now at this point. It's just plumbing, right? It's the, it's, it's the new Hotmail. Did I say that out loud? That's not oh, right. I feel bad. That's, I feel that's bad. not right. Hotmail. <laughs> I, need, I need a sound effect for, for ripping on Hotmail. Yeah. Uh, mm, I've, I've got all the sound effects here. No, that's right. Chat room, you can't trigger sound effects from there. Um, right. Hotmail. No, I can't. 
one, one, one show at a time. Hotmail. Oh, you mean here's one. I expect you to die. <laughs> Goldfinger. Never, no. never going. I expect it's... you to die, Mr. Bond. Yes. No. Carrie lives in OWA, so well, I don't know what that says about Carrie. Um. Yeah. There's there's something to be said about OWA. That's not too bad. Outlook Web want, Access. Yeah, Outlook Web. If you want to set your out of office, you know OWA. Yes, and then Outlook on the phone. Can we talk about Outlook on the phone? That's that's been pretty good for me. Yeah. Um. Yeah. All right. Are you an iPhone guy or an I Android? Am. I am an iPhone person because I'm yeah. I'm completely in the Apple ecosystem. Yeah, and once you're in, it's really hard to get out. Yeah. I was I was chatting with a friend the other day, and he's like, I'm thinking about getting out of Apple. And we started just talking about how many devices he has. It's like, now you, he's like, because well, I, I kind of, you know, he's admiring my Pixel 3. And he's like, what would it take for me to go over to that? And we started talking, and I'm like, dude, like, do you understand how tightly embraced in that walled garden you are? Yeah. That's pretty hard to get out of. Well, and he was like, I'll just sacrifice my music. It's like, it's not just your music. No, no, no. It's a lot of things. So, right, um, by using Outlook on my phone, right, that means I can take my my email and go over to another device real easy. I do OneDrive with all my photos. Yep. So, okay, I get my, my current photos that are on my phone backed up to iTunes, iCloud, I whatever, I drive. Don't know where my stuff is. It, it's in a data center in North Carolina. And I, I have it automatically syndicate over to OneDrive because I have the family plan for office. Right. I pay a couple bucks each year and everybody in my family gets a terabyte of storage. I thought that I thought that was a great thing, Richard, until I realized that my daughter was recording herself dancing and singing in musical videos and she filled a terabyte from her phone making TikTok videos. See, this is normal teenagers. This is the new... You remember the old teenager stuff was they were always on the phone back when the phone was wired to the wall, yeah. right? Like, get off the phone. And that's when you knew where the phone was. You right, called yeah. a phone number, you knew where that was. You don't have to ask where they are. If yeah. you got to them, you know where they are. Exactly. But, you know, we try to figure out what's the new teenager thing, right? TikTok. Blowing out your SMS limits, that was a good one. Then we just went on limited SMS. Blowing out data limits on yourself, that's a good one. But I like this filling up your your sky drive filling your, up your, your yeah your one drive that's the new teenager clean up your one drive yes you've got a full terabyte there full of you dancing and singing to music and clean up your room kid come on yeah clean up your room you let you have you have the new clean up the room that's right and it's not like i can go out to to best buy or or wherever and pick up another terabyte and just snap it in there no no yeah. Go online and you have to pay more. You want yeah. another terabyte? Here you go. Yeah, you can pay for another terabyte. It's just much a month. So what are we going to take away that's that much a month? You know. Um, I'm going to come to Carrie's comment in just a second here. But TikTok, have, have you been keeping an eye on TikTok? I I try and watch it. I just feel like I lose IQ points when I do. It, it, what the segments are 15 or 30 seconds? Yeah, and they they rot in my brain. People are now posting developer education videos in 30-second chunks on TikTok. Okay. Like, you're kidding, right? Yeah, that doesn't seem like the best way. I mean, you're going to put a lot of effort into trying to get those 30 seconds to get to something. It's because they moved there from, from Instagram. They were doing this on Instagram. Now they're over on TikTok doing it. It's like... Because they got so much more room. You got so much more room. Yes. Oh. And the best part is they'll say links in my profile and you click on the link and it goes to a YouTube. Right. <laughs> like, so um, it's a cross social media strategy essentially. Oh yeah. Back and forth, all that stuff. Sounds like something you could be doing, grabbing the right 30 seconds out of a Twitch stream and turning it into a, a TikTok. The, the number of clips that, that get made out of my channel have been, some of them are hysterical, just drop dead funny. Mm -hmm. Um, there was what was the one we did there was the one I did the other week when I welcomed Raiders in and I played the good the bad and the ugly <laughs> we code here yeah we write code here right <laughs> like all right and I've, I've got I've got Hedley Lamar from Blazing Saddles I want rustlers cutthroats 
Murderers. This is how we recruit developers. Desperados. Mugs, pugs, thugs, nitwits, halfwits, dimwits, vipers, snipers, con men, agents, yes. bandits, muggers, buggerers, bushwhackers, right? horn swagglers, horse thieves, train robbers, bank robbers, diggers, diggers, and messages. Yeah. We're just trying to recruit developers. This is what HR sounds yeah. like at Microsoft. You can find an HR person, they're running around with that going on, going through their head. Right. So, um, you like how I censored that? You like the little bit of censoring there? I'm just saying, anyways, it was getting, you know, this gets a little coarser. All right, okay, there's a line. I get it. Oh, yeah. There there were actually, like, th not just the two bleeps, but there were three other things that I removed. <laughs> <laughs> really just clipped them out. Just really. <laughs> right out. <laughs> uh, oh, man. So, okay. Uh, looks like Kathleen will be ready in just a few minutes. Awesome. So I just got a text from her. That's awesome. Um, Carrie pointed out the other the other digital social media thing that I've really gone after is Discord. Interesting. Yeah. Everybody's got one. Everybody's got a Discord server because yeah. they're nothing to set up. It costs you nothing. Yep. You, you end up with a party line out there. I, I sit in a party line on Discord all day. Like, when I'm not broadcasting, I hop off and I sit in, in the party line, and we're talking about whatever. And yep. and the best part about this one, we named our party line Vegas. <laughs> okay, why? Because whatever happens in Vegas stays okay. in Vegas. I get it, yeah. It, it happens on this particular Discord. We're not sharing it beyond it. Exactly. You know? Mm. And it's... Um, it, funny thing is, most of us don't know our own real, know the real names of the other people. Oh, I, interesting. I'm the public guy, so it's easy for folks to find out who I am. Yeah. But everybody's anonymous, so it's you. You want to complain about work or whatever? Fantastic, go for it. That's, go. Interesting. There's people there to listen and and engage with, and uh, they've actually got some real interesting insights from different industries and different groups. But. Uh, yeah, that cross pollinization thing is very powerful. You know, it is. I remember in the old days. I had a, I had two friends that were, I mean, in the tech industry, but doing different things. And the three of us would get together every Friday for an hour or two and just talk through our week. Yeah. Push each other to be better, to do more. Yeah. Copper Beardy oh, in the chat room says he should have a Discord just to talk about beards. Beards, really? I'm. You know what? I'm sure it exists. Sure it exists gotta be so we need one to talk about sequin jackets no no you really don't <laughs> i mean either just you and ward bell where i think that all it is so i have a friend who's going to who's also going to be at twitchcon at the end of the month his name is christopher talk he uh he works for a cosplay company but he also on stream uh custom makes clothing this guy oh, has what? more custom made pants than i've seen and it, <laughs> And, How many custom-made pants do you need? I mean, I, after one. But why not? When you see a cool pattern, hey, there's a cool pattern with the Avengers on it. Pants. Yeah. Hey, there's a cool pattern with Doctor Who's whatever on it. Pants. You know, yeah. it's... <laughs> Most people make that into a t-shirt. He's making pants. T-shirts, you want to actually make a statement. Something you want to be proud of and pants. Oh, okay, talk. That's your thing. So Tuck, right? He goes by Tuck Custom here on Twitch. Uh, he he made a sequin jacket for Dragon oh. Con. That was the big gamer conference in pop culture conference convention in Atlanta this past weekend. Right. Yeah. Huge. And we're connecting to do the sequin jacket meetup at TwitchCon. <laughs> I love it. That's fantastic. It's gonna. There's it, pictures with Flash just aren't gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's, you're gonna you're gonna create some interesting problems. And, and look, I don't have a problem with your sequin jacket, mostly because there's only one of them. There's there can be only well, well, no, there's going to be at so least two. Up, yeah, once you end it, well, I'm talking about you, Jeff. Once okay. you have a collection of sequin jackets, then there's a conversation that needs to be had. But that's a problem. I'll stick with right. the hats, okay? Well, because, yeah, the hats are fine. The blazer, blazer is good. It's like when the gold lame starts. No, not going there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. So, but, and, and I'm, I'm actually starting to collect, I don't even have them yet. I'm starting to collect gamer jerseys, right? Mm. So this is, right, this is the thing, right? It, it's, they're almost like bowling shirts. They're that light material that, that helps, right, wick moisture away from you, all that. 
Yep. And uh, I've got at least two of them coming in the next month for myself. Twitch is issuing jerseys to all of the partners that have Twitch logo on it and stuff. They haven't shown us what it looks like yet, but I get one of those. And I'm, I've also issued jerseys now for the Live Coders team. Oh. So everybody everybody on the team that signed up and filled out the information, including folks like uh, Carrie Payette there in chat, are getting – it's it's a black jersey with purple trim. It's got a Twitch logo on the side, and it's got our gear logo on it. I am so excited to give these out, and I can't wait to see where all folks get their picture taken at conferences, conventions, wherever, wearing these jerseys, you know? So Yeah. It'll be interesting, and it's interesting that they're so light. I guess it's because you're, you know, when you're streaming, you're under enough lights that you got to keep yourself cool. Yeah, yeah. That well, not just that, but when you're gaming, right, you get into all the stress of the moment. Right. So, I think, yeah, that and being away for 24 hours, hopped up on what uh, on the the uh, caffeinated beverage of your choice. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, that stuff is so horrible. He said finishing his cup of tea. Right. It's amazing. It's wonderful. That is not an advertisement. Nice. Um, yeah. So definitely stuff there that uh, I'm I'm excited about as far as right. Thank you. Thank you for joining Developer Swag Chat. Nice. Um, well, Goran Hal wants to talk about WebAssembly, which is kind of on topic. Certainly something we're going to be you know, talking about at DevInt as well. And and very and much so. He, as a guy who you know these days when I do talks, it's mostly about seeing the landscape of development of all, all of these interviews and things I've done. And then WebAssembly is one of those breakthrough technologies. It's like, although yeah. I don't think it's general purpose at all, right? I don't know that I would build a, a public-facing website using anything in WebAssembly. I'm not talking about Blazor necessarily, but they all sort of suffer the same problems. They're SEO resistant. Yes. And their prints are big. You know, you're 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 chunking a run times down into the browser. Sure, um, I think when you when you look at the WebAssembly problem as far as search engines, right? Google crossed through this problem when they started indexing and playing playing through JavaScript that was running. Right? They'll run JavaScript for you, so you, they cross that boundary. It's bound to happen at some point if there's enough uptake that they'll do the same thing with WebAssembly. But it's going to be dangerous for a crawler to be running WebAssembly. And stunningly difficult because you're totally blind going in with the DLL. Oh my gosh, yes. What hosts are you going to run in? I, I Yeah, I don't know how to make that work. On the other hand, I mean, you make the most, I think the most important point, which is that it is just imp as important to Google to index everything as it is for us to be indexed. Yes, they if they don't solve it and somebody else does, you know, suddenly there's there's a chance they they that their monopoly in search is endangered. And it also though raises the question of, are you using WebAssembly to build that type of brochure where you're using it to build in a complex application? Is that yeah. something that should be indexed? I think it's, you make the valid point. And again, you get back to this idea of I think WebAssembly is a phenomenal solution for the inside app, the, the, oh, yeah. the working in a common language across the platforms that uh, where the compiler takes a larger role in the testing infrastructure. It's just like easy to deliver forms over data apps inside of organizations. Like, and they're you know, by the thousands. Oh, yeah. Gordon Howe says, uh, said about WebAssembly, it, the virtual machine in your browser would be really cool if you could have several WebAssemblies like containers, .NET WebAssembly, Python, and be able to have them interoperate. That's actually something that they are building. Yeah. That the, the, the browser standards folks t started talking about this because if you're compiling down to WebAssembly, to be able to call into another WebAssembly, you've, you're, at that point, you're at the same API. Yeah. So to be able to crisscross, right, should be possible, and it's something they are talking about. And there's no reason you wouldn't be, you know, the container angle is important. Right now, we're very much in the virtual machine space where you are bringing your operating system into every one of those instances. Oh, yeah. Can we get to the container space where there are sort of core host DLLs that are already living in the browser and you just reference them rather than have to start them up because it's just, it, it's too big. It's too much overhead. It's going to have to mature more. Oh, yeah. 
uh, especially if we're going to start talking about multiple instances, and and that isolation would be useful, even if you're staying in in one runtime. So it's like I I want to use .NET, but I have three different things I want to run, and I don't want them necessarily living in that same instance. So the idea, but I don't want three copies of the .NET framework being hauled down in a D, in DLL form to interoperate. Yeah, um, getting down into into the binaries it makes it tricky, but it's possible. Yeah. Well, so. yeah, and, and at the same time, you need to stay safe. So there, there's a part of that. There, there's a part related to that as well. Yeah. Um, I think it looks like Kathleen's just about ready. Wow. Okay. Let's see if we can get her to jump on the call here. Yep, we're ready, she says. Uh, let's, uh, let's try and add her. Let's see how it goes. Uh, da -da -da. go back to this call, hit the button, and... Add. All right, this is the part chat room where you're going to get to see the the sausage being made and lighten this yeah. stuff up here. Let's see if we can get our for the friend. First, for the fall session. This is the first time we're doing the bring in the guest thing, and we're going to see how it works. Let's see what happens. It's calling. Yeah, that call is transformed. Yeah, that's right. The my the my chat bot is not running in this chat room today. We don't need yeah. all that craziness. <laughs> well, and, you know, you, I think you're very familiar with it since you made it. Yeah. But I think it'd be hard on a guest. A little bit. I don't want to turn that, that on. Everybody knows who Scott is. So maybe I'll just turn on the Scott commands. <laughs> Cuz we do have all the Scots at the show this time. We do. Yeah. Do we have Do we have the the red shirt Scott joining us for a virtual one of these? You know he's uh, he's fairly tough to schedule. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'd love to, but I don't know if we're going to pull it off. But I think at least one of the other Scots is on board. Okay. Let's see here. Um, she says she does not see the call. Yeah, is Skype being being fun let's see so i'm clicking it through and i can see the little thing spinning here on skype yeah didn't get the call I'm here it is I'm trying it again i've had the experience where the device i want to answer the call on isn't ringing but every other device in my room is yeah right oh it's a good one Ooh. Uh, I'm calling this account. And I wonder if we're, doing, if we're playing Skype versus Skype for business games. Oh, I hope not. Oh, always fun. Um, oh, you know what? I see two Kathleen's in the Skype. Hmm... Let me see here. Let me just take a quick look. Skype name. Yeah. Oh, she's on Skype for business. No, no. We need you on consumer Skype. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. How did I guess? It's going to be fun when we get this worked out. Because then yeah. I get to size and make sure her video is placed appropriately. And we've got a scene change for that. Where do you see this? Well, and, they, and the reason you're using consumer skype is because it has the obs interface right yes the right oh so the, when you're dealing with video right you want to use video protocols that allow you to transport that video through memory over the network quickly and easily and the folks that make the tricaster have a protocol called ndi yeah that's buried in consumer skype yeah but it's a relatively new feature i mean i guess a couple of years now um, in Skype, it's been there. Yeah, it's been about a year now yeah. that that it's there. And um, hooking up, whether it's to OBS or to a TriCaster, um, yep. real easy to do with Skype. And right then, it, it automatically puts the watermark on it. You can't see the watermark because we trimmed video to fit in these cool little frames. 
Yep. Um, but it works great. Really nice. Now, I, hang I, on. Switching over to using OBS, because you know what I do right now for .NET Rocks, if we have multiple guests, is I actually run separate machines, each running a version of consumer Skype, all going through a mixing board to to so I have isolation for each person's voice and can mix everything together so they can hear each other. Yep. I've been considering that I would switch to OBS just because then you can run a multi-channel Skype like you're about to do and be able to pull all the files off in isolation as well, which is cool. Yeah. But it, the other day I had uh, on run as I had a two guest situation and I fired up Zencaster. Oh yes. And it just worked. Mm-hmm. It's a, a web, and it's a web based. I was able to push out a link to folks that were that, and they were, it turned out they were actually Google folks, so they didn't even have Skype. And they're like, "Do I have to?" And I'm like, "And I have workarounds for that anyway." But the Zencaster thing worked like a dream. I, I think the biggest challenge being a podcast for 15 years is just shaking off the cruft of stuff you built 10 plus years ago and workflows you built 10 plus years ago, and sort of embrace, hey, podcasting's much more mainstream now, and there are things that can help you. There's there's something to be said. It, it, what I've learned here on Twitch is I end up reinventing how I connect things together, how the hardware that I'm using every two or three months. Yeah, I'm going to drop something new in. I'm going to reinvent how this works. This actually, this video that you see of me is coming through a Sony A6000 camera on a tripod that is actually not connected to this machine I'm broadcasting from. It's actually going through a little Intel NUC on the next desk over here and I'm sending it back across the network to OBS and I've literally got my own a machine that's dedicated just to my camera I'm going to move all of OBS over there so that I've got two machines one for running Visual Studio so that when Visual Studio decides to crash it doesn't take down the stream as well yeah well and that's you know and you're throwing some electron into that loop like oh it's, it's not trivial to get all these different pieces working together and, uh, and actually, you know, keep it running well. I, I upgraded my, my laptop to a Surface Book 2. Yes. What do you think? And it's, it's a beautiful machine. I went to the 15-inch because, you know, I'm getting old and uh, bigger screen better. Yeah. But I have noticed if I'm actually really hammering the GPU, the power supply can't keep up. Like at the end of the session of whatever I'm doing, multi-channel video or things like that, I'm down 10% on my battery. So at .NET Conf last year, we ran that stream through my Surface Book 2, 15 right. inch with the GPU, plugged in and we had it cranked all the way up for performance wise because we had people coming in over Skype, they're doing their yep. broadcast. And we, we turned the contrast and the brightness all the way down. We closed everything we could and it would not keep battery yeah and we had to go for 24 hours oh that's a problem we got about eight hours in and realized we had four hours left <laughs> right and this is plugged in yeah, uh, the whole... so literally how power is that gpu eating like it's got to be dozens of watts like 30 or 40 it's got to be but the power supply they gave you doesn't provide that much yeah so we literally sent somebody running across campus to go get another machine. And in the middle of the show, we swapped machines that we were broadcasting from. Right. So, um, call, Jeff. I don't know what the concern was. What, what's the concern? This is, this is actually right. It, I was using, this is it right here. The, uh, the, uh, surface books, not charger, but it's their dock. And right. it, it does tell you the wattage on the bottom of it. And with the light that I have here, it's really hard for me to read. Um, oh, no, wait. It doesn't tell me the wattage on it. It just says Microsoft Redmond, blah, 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 blah. Patent, patent, patent. So get get the output voltage and the output amperage will be on it. Yeah, there we go. Multiply them together. Yep. Uh, 15 volts, 4 amps. 4 amps. So there you go. It's a 60-watt power supply. Yeah, and it wasn't able to keep up. No, you're probably drawing something like 70 watts, just enough that it's tipping it over the edge. It doesn't discharge the battery fast. It just does discharge the battery. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. So just trying to get it to keep up, it's like, are you kidding? 
Fuel Snable's laptop has a 200 watt charger. Well, there you go. Yeah, you know, that's about that's got to be a power supply big enough to kill a small animal with. <laughs> Back in the old P4 era of laptops, where I actually had laptops you couldn't put on your lap because they'd sterilize you uh, because they got so hot. I mean, I had one that actually had embedded legs to, so that it always had airspace underneath so that it could actually keep the air circulating or it would overheat. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, and they made big power supplies, 200, 300s, like that's some serious power supplies. These days, it's the gaming laptops with the real 1080s the proper NVIDIA video cards on them that, that are that are crushed like that. So I have, this is, the, uh, I wanted to look at a laptop, all right? Now, it, here we are, we're going into laptop talk. Um, mm. I wanted to get a laptop for when I'm on the road because that, I, I could not keep going with that, uh, with that Surface Book when I'm broadcasting. I wanted to have a little bit more power, right? And if I added anything more into that Surface Book, it was going to... It, it, right, I'd be killing my battery even faster. Yeah. So I got this is an Intel Hades Canyon NUC, and it's got a GPU, not just in it, but on die with the i7 oh. 8800. It, it's an AMD Radeon. Wow. Let that just sit that, in for a second. That, those NUCs are tiny too. Like that, that would. If you don't need the battery. Like that sounds like a better OBS machine than a laptop. It is because it came with 32 gig, mm -hmm. right? Came with a half terabyte on an M.2 drive, and it it's got um, six USB three jacks on it. Nice. And uh, six or eight? I think it's six. It's got two HDMI's, um, two uh, two of the mini Display Ports. And it's yeah. got three USB Cs, Bluetooth. So you get a port uh, wireless display screen, like a one one of the one or two pounders. Yeah. And it, and you get a real keyboard. You skip battery stuff altogether. You've got more horsepower, and it probably packs down small. It, it's it's real small. It's about the size of a tablet. I can't grab it. It's all wired in over here. Yep. But uh, amazing little device, and. We tried using it. I took this to Channel 9. We hooked it up with some of the things, some of the video that they have that they're running Adobe Premiere through. Mm -hmm. And we edited a 4K video with it. That is and the man these days, isn't it? It ate it up. That's nice. Right? It's like, okay, solid state, completely portable. If you had to pack the GPU on a desktop and transport it in a tower case, you're going to snap that card off. Yeah, something's going to break. Inevitably, yeah. those machines are not meant to be shipped around. It doesn't matter what kind of case you put it in. But it's not meant to be exactly. But I can drop this in my backpack, and it's nothing. It's smaller. It's well, and hell, you could add another one. Yes, easily, right? Another power supply, another box, and a little bit of networking gear. Like it's not hard to have two of those. It's just screens and the keyboards that take up the room. It's the human interface that's the problem. So regarding networking gear, I was ready to get, I wanted to get a, a networking bridge, a wireless bridge that I could, when I show up at virtual, de at real dev intersection, I can mm -hmm. plug in, here's the cable from the MGM Grand in Las Vegas when we're there in November, right. plug that into my bridge, and I can put both my NUC and my, my uh, machines that folks are displaying from, put them all on the same network segment. Terrific. Right. Great idea. So I, I had put this on my Amazon wish list, like, oh, here's some of the gear that I want to buy to finish tricking out my, my travel rig. Um, I had a birthday about two weeks ago. Uh -huh. My mother, who I had previously shared Amazon wish list with for, for Christmas and other holidays, as you do, um, gave me the network router that was on my wish list. <laughs> right. She never would have picked it otherwise. She didn't know what no! she just you but it was on your list it was on my list so my mother gave me a network router <laughs> like thanks ma I thank love you it. I, I mean don't get me wrong i'm very appreciative but it's like i i was gonna buy it myself and uh, right if you're something for a birthday you're not gonna tip ask for hey you know what i'm looking at a spool a spool of cat five that'd be really great <laughs> yeah i just kind of order those things for myself it's not, right not, not, and I, right, I'm just parking lotting things like, ah, we'll take a look at this later. You know, this is they, these are the kinds of things that we're going to look at when we're ready to do that next upgrade. Here's the checklist to go down. No, no. That's what happens when mom snoops your Amazon <laughs> wish. <laughs> oh, I'm thought. so sorry. You know, 
So, um, looks like I'm I'm trying to see where our guest is here. Yeah, software only takes so long to install. Yeah, although it is Skype. Oh. <laughs> oh. Poor Skype. They've actually done a really nice job with some of the some of the features recently. You know, we mentioned the NDI features. Um, yeah. I, I've noticed it, it's been using less memory. It'll actually close and go away now. It won't just yeah, hide it. Yeah, to, yeah, it's it will go away. Yeah, right. I mean, Which right now. Yeah, for this call, it's only using seventy meg on my machine. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it's electron. It's eating all my memory. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and, and Microsoft Edge. Yeah, it's Microsoft Edge. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Edge doing everything. Fuel Snable says the worst resource hog is Spotify Desktop. Well. That's a networking Ooh. thing. You got to know that's an Electron app too, right? Like it's got to be an Electron app. I don't know. It, it that would feel right. I, I would, I, I would guess. Yeah. It, well, why would anyone who needs to do a cross-platform development use anything else? Oh, I right? would use. Like, I would use C Sharp with Xamarin and WPF. Xamarin Forms. No. Uh, Fuel Snable says a, a friend is working on it. It's legacy C++. Well, okay. There you go. W what I find interesting is I do... Um, I have Spotify hooked up on my stream deck here. So I can launch Spotify. I can have it navigate around different songs, play, b play pause, back and forward. But when I launch Spotify from my stream deck, every now and again, it does that... Okay. Um... We need to uh, do an update to this machine. Uh, right. Update the application, and it doesn't come back. <laughs> it just sort of does it in. I uh, uh, I'm a big believer now in running the Spotify's and the Plex clients and so forth on non PC devices. Oh. You know, inside, inside of a Sonos, inside of a Roku, like all of those clients just seem to run so much better. The P, you don't want to run that stuff on, on PCs anymore. Yeah. Um, so I was running Plex on, on just a little... It was a... Who is this? It's a Seagate machine that hosts my, my Plex service. It's not fast enough. The processor isn't strong enough to do... On the server side, yeah. Yeah. To do the uh, transcoding. Best, so, best solution I've seen for that is a Synology. Yes. That, you know, priced accordingly. Hmm. Versus a P versus some kind of server, right? But so I try out, have good drive handling. They actually will run Docker containers and they can run Plex properly. Yes. So I tried putting Plex on the NUC and it screams. Right. I mean, of course, I'm throwing an i7 with a GPU at it and 32 gig of RAM. But. Now I'm eyeballing it like, okay, do I get another NUC just to run this? But it's it's going to be solid state. The reliability of that drive at some really point is going to come yeah. into question. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, don't know, I don't like spinning media anymore. We just don't need it. I got, yeah. I got myself a uh, 128 gig USB-C thumb drive. And I, and I realized how much faster it is than any hard drive. It's ridiculous how fast it is. Yes, the 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 accessibility for small portable media right and I had a hundred and uh, no I had a, a two hundred and fifty six gig micro SD that I used to stick in the back of my Surface Pro three right like okay now we're talking and just forget about it right it's just there it's fast storage it's yes. reliable you know it's just an extra drive and we're able to use that all right I think I have Kathleen about ready to go. Let's see if we can get her joined in here. Coming up, Jeff's Nuck Cluster, says Ultramark. <laughs> Maybe. Can we create a Beowulf cluster of these? Nice. Hey, there's Kathleen. Hey, can uh, you hear me? I can yeah. hear you indeed. <laughs> Yay. All right, here's what I'm going to do. Now let me make sure, here comes the fun part, friends. I'm going right. to get Kathleen's video loaded up for us. Give me one second here. And we will 
put you into the layout. There we go. That looks good. And oh, so close. I have one last thing. <laughs> we will get rid of that. Get rid of that. And there we go. Just need to trim. Uh, let's do this. Oh my gosh. See this? It's like on the fly. We've just added Kathleen into the show. There she is. And it just works. And it just works. Look at that, uh, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, she's over there. there. There's Kathleen. Hello, hello. Hello. How are you doing? Right. Are you doing the Brady Bunch thing now. We're looking at each other, where, even though we're all in separate rooms. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm on the East Coast, West yeah, Coast. I'm West Coast. Uh, you're down in, in Redmond, aren't you, Kath? I am in Redmond, yes. I'm sitting in uh, one of the Channel 9 offices because um, – I, it's been a long morning. Yeah. <laughs> we had a little bit of a challenge getting this one started. It's the first one, yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, thanks for being our beta tester. You know. Yeah, I was your beta tester. And we yeah. Up our struggles. It's inevitable. The, that little confusion I had about uh, Skype and Skype for business being yeah. like entirely different products. Yeah. Was think... uh, not helpful. No. No. Yeah. And, and then, then I had. Although inside of Microsoft these days, aren't you guys all teams? Yeah, we're all teams, which is why I haven't been doing Skype for a long time. And yeah. I think I even do teams with my kids, although we don't actually do it all that often. We're mostly, uh, you know, text and uh, phone. So, yeah. So I'm here now. It's all good right. Yay. I know there were folks specifically that hung out on the channel to uh, to talk a little C-sharp 8. So I hope you could. Yeah, could good. Something. Okay. That's, That's your great. Point. Your subjects i know yeah do we have any actual questions yet or are we just uh want to talk about it well I mean, how are we not going to get past nullable reference types yeah yeah we felt so like how that was is good the place. whole world not going to get past null <laughs> nullable reference types <laughs> so true. it is absolutely the the marquee feature i just i however much hard you think the team worked on that feature you probably are underestimating. It, it was just a tremendously difficult feature to land. And uh, the idea, the reason it was hard is so that it just does what you think it should do. And right. figuring out what that means was where the effort went in. And uh, it's, it's had a long tail of extra stuff to think about. But I think it's ready. And uh, I'm super excited about getting it into people's hands. And then, you know, it's going to be an interesting transition for C Sharp uh, because it really does make your code a bit different if, mm. when you uptake it. So, yeah, excited about that. Why should it be different? I thought it, we was just going to do what we expected it to do. Oh, well, yeah. But uh, right now, your code probably uh, isn't fully guarded against null reference exceptions. Right. You uh, may be partially guarded, and one of the things that when I said it, it's just set up to just work, is mm -hmm. that if you already have guards in place, then those guards will be understood by null reference types. So if you come into a method, and the first thing you do in the method is check your parameters for whether they're null, right. and then do some sort of an exit or an exception or, or some sort of a flow that would cause the rest of the code not to run, then the rest of the code knows that that cannot be a null and treats it as such. So my <laughs> existing null handler is still going to do what it always did, even though I'm now switching to null reference types. And I'm sorry, I was I'm still getting over being sick yesterday. My goodness. Oh wow. I'm sorry, Richard. Can you say that again? I was. Uh... So I, if I understand what you're saying there, that means that the code that I've written to do to manage nulls and to raise errors and so forth is still going to run, even though I'm switching to null reference types. Right. There's all the code that you have. No code will not run. Um, it's, let me simplify that even further. This is not a runtime feature. It's completely a design time feature. Mm -hmm. And it's possible uh -huh. that down the road, may, I can't even imagine we do optimization. But right now, all the code is going to run. But as you come into a method, then, or it's just one example, um, and you state something is going to be uh, not null by your code, 
then that's going to be recognized. So if right now you're doing guard clauses, they'll be recognized. Now, you don't have to use guard clauses in the future as you uh, uptake nullable reference. So if you declare something to be not, uh, not null, then it's going to be treated as not null throughout the flow of the system. And so that's the, uh, the, the eventually guard clauses won't be needed. But for now, as we're doing the transition, part of the way it just works is to recognize guard clauses. Right. So, okay. <coughs> for, for some of the folks who, who are maybe newer C-sharp developers who, who are just getting into the, the language, those folks that are, don't really know what reference types are because let's face it, a lot of folks, they just start working with the language and they're using string, int, uh, right? The various user from identity, these types of objects, they're building controllers in ASP.NET, they're building forms in WPF. A reference type, those are those more complex types that we typically see as classes, right? Yes, so a class is a reference type, yes. And, and a reference type, by the design of C-sharp, a reference type can be null, and that doesn't change. Uh, even with the, the new um, nullable reference types, by default, well, let me back up. C-sharp is a language, and when you opt in to nullable reference types, then the, the way that the code appears on the page is going to change the default. So if there is nothing following the, a variable, uh, declaration. It's just a plain declaration, and you have opted into nullable reference types, then that will be recognized as a not null, where previously it was recognized as a null. So in that sense, it's changed. But .NET itself under the hood uh, is still nullable. Uh, reference types can still be nullable. That hasn't changed. This is all a facade on the top of that uh, to make it act like nullable references are, uh, are all not null by default. Right. So, right, and then this provides us that capability of, of protecting any place where we might have accidentally passed in a, a null that we didn't expect. Right, right. So, the, the idea of, of um, nullable as a, as a feature is that right now, uh, in most applications, there are places where something shouldn't be null, but there's no guarantee of that. So the point of nullable reference types is to be able to have that guarantee. And it's done based on flow analysis of your code. So if you say, this, is, uh, this should not contain null, and you assign a null to it, well, then you're going to get a warning. Um, it's not set to be an error because we're, the goal is not breaking code. Right. Uh, so are you going to type a little bit for us here? So I am. I'm sharing my screen just to you. I was. I was oh, okay. going to bring up if we wanted to actually talk through and actually show some of these things. I could share, uh, open a live share to you, so you, we can see a little bit of maybe what you're talking about and talk through it in a little more uh, real world sample. Just writing a little bit of code together. Yeah. So uh, I can probably do that. Uh, I am very weak on live share, and I. Uh, am not prepared, but we certainly can work through it. Null reference is not that complicated, so uh, we should be able uh, to work through it if okay. you think that would be helpful for people. I think we can definitely do that. So what I what I can do is I'm, I'm already screen sharing back over to Kathleen and Richard. I have... Uh, da -da -da, where did it go? I just had Visual Studio open. Here it is. So I just started a console application. I'm going to start a live share. Okay. And I will send over to Kathleen and Richard also, if you'd like. Um, yeah, three hands is too three sets of hands is too many. Oh, it's, I could just to the code for sure. So this. So uh, you're going to have to walk me through live share. I apologize for that, oh, but maybe this... that'll be interesting for a few people that are uh, watching and uh, aren't real familiar with live share. So let me do this. And before I share the screen, I'm going to drop the link right there in chat. All right. So in Visual Studio, um, go, f go up to File, and there is underneath Closed Solution, there is Join Live Share Session. All right. I'm in code because I'm on a Mac. Fantastic. 
Uh, there's okay. a live share button on the in the panel on the left side. If you All have right. the live share. So let me get a new window. I may not. So we may run into some problems, but I can talk you through this if we need to. Uh, live share. That looks like live share. Uh, so join a collaboration session or. Yep. Join a uh, collaboration. Where and did you put that link? I put it into the Skype chat. All right. I am looking for that right now. This I'm not familiar with this crazy uh, uh, Skype. Uh, where is the chat now? Uh, wow. Okay. Uh, so uh, mouse over the bottom right. There is a conversation bubble that will got appear. It. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. And so just type. Put. <laughs> sorry, I'm a little bit. No, uh, you're good. Getting this. Would okay. So join the collaboration session. It's going to give me a chance for. Uh, for that URL, just copy that in. Copy that into where? Uh, copy it from Skype, and when you click, when you have the join collaboration session in VS Code, paste yeah. it in the the address there. All right. So I have to sign in. I suppose I could do that with uh, GitHub. Yep. Uh, so that should be well. That should go well. That's right, Fuel Snable. Stop moving my buttons around. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I've got, uh, um, let's see, if I just hit. And I'm going to come back to Johan's question here in a minute, I think, in chat. Yeah, that's a, it's, and the answer is complicated, Johan. I think uh, Kathleen's audio died. I think she muted while she was. Okay. Blowing sorry, nose. I'm back. No, it was good. I'm, I'm sorry, I just called. It's not making it. Uh, it's not making it great. Just one more thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's asking about the availability of C Sharp eight in the framework 4.7x or 4.8. It's not there. Uh, C Sharp eight is only supported in uh, .NET Core. So a few things will work, but it so much will not work that it's just altogether not supported because uh, it would be very confusing to figure out, well, this little thing works, but these things I really care about don't work. And the reason that they don't work is because of types. And so new types are being added to .NET Core. And also in .NET Core, we can have, uh, in a major release like 3.0, we can do small breaking changes. We try not to, and we'll document them as we yeah. need to. Um, but it does make for an easier evolution, and that's why we did .NET Core. It's a, it was a big driver uh, for that. So, uh, right. Yeah, right. and I, I pasted into the chat there um, Mads' blog post about how Super. it's going to receive yeah, sharp that's a... up in .NET Core. All right, let me show. Here's Visual Studio. There you go. Okay. So this is live share. You can see a little tape flag there where Kathleen's typing and showing us. And I just started a new .NET Core 3 console application. Um, .NET Core 3 Preview 9 was just released yesterday at the time of the recording of that's right. this video. Why didn't that capitalize? And I think that's also the last of the previews, right? Next yes. comes the final. The release. Right, right, right. So this IntelliSense is making me crazy, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's just say name dot uh, length. Okay, that should work. Uh, so that works fine, and w we're used to that. We don't have this opted in yet. And now, oh boy, you've got Mads' blog post. We changed the uh, we changed the actual opt in uh, text a couple of times. Do you have that in front of you there, where you pasted it? Or we can go look for it real quick. I have forgotten what we actually wound up for on the uh, nullable opt-in. Um, yeah, let me grab the blog post here real quick. Okay. And that blog post is from November of uh, last. No, so. that's not going to be right. Let it's me old. check. the. Uh, that should be in the other place that you can look for that is going to be what's new in C Sharp. And so uh, nullable reference types is discussed there. And uh, let's get that uh, uh, da, 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 da. Our, 
You do have to be an eight. I'll check that we're an eight. We can check that. Uh, uh, I'm go. looking for a. Anybody in the chat already knows this? I'm sorry that I don't have it. Help us out. Feel free. So here's the uh, documentation for what's new in C sharp eight, and I'm going to go down to nullable reference types. I'm here on right. Docs Microsoft Com. And I actually did not see it cruising that page. Uh, so. Um, uh, an overview of nullable reference types. Here we go from February. It's just nullable, I believe. The nullable element was previously named nullable context yeah, options. Yeah, that's not... Uh, Hash that's nullable? Not looking, I don't think that's right. Uh, and it, I don't know why it would be capped. So, um, ah! <laughs> we will figure this out. I'm I think there was... I have this. Uh, um, if I remember... Well, let's check the CS project, right? The project file needs to opt in to the latest version of the app of the programming language. Right, right. So if I click into the project file, right now it just says target framework netcore app three, right? We can light up with the language version with the lang version, right? And right, I, I, exactly. Is it 8.0 that we key in there? Yes. And... Now you might be able to start seeing some of that hash working. And the other post I want to see if we can find is, uh, did you f did you find it? No, I did a quick search, and I did the last blog post I see from Mads is from yeah right, a few months ago. So there's ago. another post here that uh, um, I'll paste in I don't know if I can I should be able let me get this just straight into the um, into the the tw twitch window okay uh, there's a link this is Philip Carter's blog post which was August the 6th which is an excellent post um, on uh, it's called try out notable reference types so and let me open this up here there I we go. am gonna guess that uh, so turn them on is to turn it on and here's how yeah yeah, nullable uh, enable. That's uh, low. Property you can group. do it in the project file, but I'm going to do it in the uh, in the file itself. So we'll just come up here, and where I tried to do that, we'll just do nullable enable, and see if that looks like everybody's happy. And uh, I can check that if I do string here with a question mark. I should get a warning. So uh, we can see if that is actually enabled. Yep, I and see a green line under the name. Okay, I don't see it yet. We would want to see a green line under the name on line 15. Yep, and yep. when I mouse over there, you can see it says, name may be null here, dereference right. of a possibly null reference. Right, so you know we've all seen code like that uh, mm -hmm. before nullable reference types, which wouldn't have the question mark, of course, where we pass something in. We did something simple on a uh, parameter that we believed would always be non-null, and surprise, it's null, and then we run into um, a problem. So that tells us that the, the question mark tells us that it could be null, and when it might be null, then we're going to get the warning. So if we call that code, then we can say, um, we'll just say test, and we'll pass in a string, and this should go just fine. Uh, we'll, we'll give a name, we'll say Jeff. Okay, so that should be fine um, because we're calling that and we're passing something in that's not null. But if we pass in null, which is perfectly fine if you don't have null, nullable uh, turned on, now right. that should give us a warning. Yeah, you see the green uh, underline. And then if I say string uh, x, I'm using great variable names today, and I'll call, say that that's Richard, okay, then uh, I call test with X, then flow analysis should, should, should tell me that that is fine, that that's mm -hmm. not a problem, um, because obviously it, it would not be a problem. Uh, if I said uh, string uh, question, if I just said string uh, Y equals null, of course that is going to be, we should, we'll get a warning here. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm not sure of is whether is whether when if we say string question mark Z uh, is going to be equal to <coughs> yeah. 
No, I didn't cough for an hour before this. <laughs> <laughs> That's the rules. Yeah, really. I mean, making me crazy. Okay, so, uh, so that one I believe will have a warning, but I'm not certain of it. Flo would actually tell us that it is a safe call, uh, so that one may not have a warning. So that's basically, you know, the way that this works is to trace back to the source uh, a nullable a, a, that something is. Uh, we're saying something's not null, and then we're we're walking through uh, the the code literally the. Um, it, the it, it's it's flow analysis. It literally walks through the flow. So yeah. if I do this and I just say if <coughs> is not equal to null, I like those extra brackets in there. So I'm going to add them. So now with those extra brackets. Uh, then uh, that is going to be no warning, even though without this line, then there is a warning. Does so that make sense? It does. Um, and, and it's it feels it, interesting, right, that we put the question mark at the end here, right, to indicate that it is allowed to be null. Right. Right, so it's like we're we're lighting up the extra feature, and everywhere where we didn't have the question mark, now it's not allowed to be null there, right? Right. So it's the reverse of what we had before, and there was a lot of angst about that. Um, but in the end, this feature is designed for where we want C sharp to be in three to five years. So obviously, right now. There would be a certain simplicity if we always stated it or, you know, it was the reverse and you said when it was not null because that would be consistent with where we've been. Okay. But this feature was designed for where we want to be and we want to be at a point where the default, if you don't know something needs to contain a null, then you tell it not to contain a null and you only add that null possibility uh, when you know it's needed. So, for example, middle names uh, need to be uh, uh, need to be nullable. The everybody's finding out that Miguel de Acasa doesn't have a middle name from this. Uh, <laughs> he gets used a lot in samples, and so uh, Miguel doesn't have a middle name. Other people don't have middle names, so middle names should be nullable, and then your code should respond intelligently when there isn't. Um, a middle name, but first names and last names in general are not null, although there are people that just have a single name, um, and that would be, you know, that'd be something you'd have to figure out how you wanted to handle in your application, but it's quite common in applications for first name and last name to be required, but middle name not to be required. Yeah, all right. So, yeah. And you have to tolerate it, right? Like, it's just sort of the reality is, and what I like about the no middle name thing is it's kind of legit, although... In the yeah. military, they actually put in your middle name, NMI. No middle name. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. So, uh, you know, the interesting thing about this is how people, how it's going to, how we're going to transition. It's this is b really big transition to go from, uh, from not not having this feature to using this feature. Yeah. And. So there's a couple of things on that, one of which is you don't have to uptake this feature just because it's there. And if you have a large working application, you may want to postpone looking at this and maybe never do it in that application uh, because it is going to be work to fix things. Uh, we've looked at, done a huge effort on the, uh, on the core FX side, so the, what would have been the BCL previously, and starting the effort to get that annotated bugs have been found. And if you make this investment, most people are finding, oh, that could have been a bug. Somebody could have passed null in there, right. and then we could have wound up with this situation. Well, I really, you know what I like about your, your explanation here, uh, Kathleen, is you really get how this is a, uh, a compile time feature, not a run time feature. This is helping that's me right. as a programmer think about how my code works. Right. It, I think that's actually, you're, you're hitting on the most important point of this feature, which is its communication. It's mm -hmm. the person who writes the code is communicating 
what should be not null and what should be right. null. And the compiler's coming well, back with them with a, I don't think this says what you think it says kind of. Exactly. Yeah. Or you're doing something you didn't mean to do here. So if I if I take this line out again, hey, that could be null. And, and you're just dotting off of it. Now, it's yeah. easy enough for me to just do a question mark right there. But then that could be null. Now I have a nullable there. So now if I said length uh, dot two string, okay, now that should give a different squiggle. And so all of these complex things can actually be difficult for a human to see. Um, now it becomes that it's just like any compiler effort. The compiler's job is to help us see the things that we didn't see. And this is just one more step uh, in that. And then if I wanted to fix that, I could put a question mark there. And so it's etc. So there's a couple of ways that we can work around uh, the points at which we have uh, that we have nulls. Um, but the 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 core feature is just telling you when you're doing something you you probably didn't want to do. And I now, I, I like yeah, what you're ahead. saying about how you can turn this on and off when you're ready to start using it. Right, that hash with with the enable up at the top. Okay, that's a that's an yeah. easy directive for us. And there's also a, an indicator, and in chat rooms pointing this out as well, that you can put in your project file to light up or disable the feature appropriately. It, like yes. you're saying, when you're ready for this, give it a try. Right. And the thing, the good thing about the project is actually for new code. So then you can just, from the get-go, your whole project is set up to be nullable. The reason I like showing the, the file-specific one, and it's not just file-specific. You can put this any place you want. So, you know, you could move that, uh, that nullable enable down to right before the line that you care about. So you can put mm. it any place in your code you want. Um, so it's just an, it's just a compiler di directive. You can put it anywhere, and you can disable and, and enable oh. and do whatever you want. I I'm not seeing that right now as being super high value unless you have a large file and you can only get halfway through it. Um, I think that it's um, that I may be wrong on that, uh, but I think that in general you kind of want to take a file and then start working through from that point, uh, which does bring up the fact that we are annotating the BCL early on, which means we're adding nullable to it uh, early. That's, that's where we're starting because it's sort of the core of people's work. It will take a while. So I think we've done 20,000 now, oh my um, gosh. but we have like 70,000 to go. So this is going to change. Uh, we will make mistakes and we will fix them. Uh, we're not going to consider that a breaking change that we would not take if we make a mistake in the way that we handle null references. But it's really funny to think about because this, these make some really hard decisions. So, for example, toString, which I added there, should toString be uh, return its return value be not null or possibly null? Hmm. And that is a really hard question. Ooh. And it's a really hard question. So within the work that is well designed with, you know, the stuff Microsoft's done, stuff most people have done, that's going to be a string, but it can be null. So you can do that. Wow. Now, I also look at, right, the, the compiler directive, and it's kind of hidden behind your tape flag right now, um, There, but it's there on line 25. There it is. Um, I'm... I'm used to seeing stuff like that, these compiler directives inside of my C sharp classes. And they make sense. You have the if defs and these types of things mm -hmm. that you right. you carry around. And when we do think about uh, other places in the framework that you're doing and you want to check those things, as a web developer, I, I, I see this and think, oh, what if I want to do that in my Razor pages, in my Blazor components? Can I use that directive on those pages? That's a really good question, and I'm going to say I assume yes, but I have not done that yet, and I don't know if there's a reason that Razor or Blazor has not fully updated C Sharp 8, so uh, I cannot speak with confidence on okay. that. And you're, you're saying that, Jeff, you're saying server-side Blazor. You're not talking about client-side Blazor, because I can think of a good reason why client-side Blazor wouldn't have it. Uh, well, oh my gosh, yeah, client-side Blazor's still got a ways to go to be built here, and there's uh, there's definitely security concerns there you're going to want to 
I mean, at this right. point, the client side blades are still depending on mono. Yeah. Yeah, not on core. Yeah. Right. Because, because core is written in C sharp. Like the, in the end, what runs inside of WebAssembly has to go through LTTM, right? Like it has to be C. Right. Yeah. Mono still built in C. There's a way they could convolutedly generate C from core, but that's a big pile of work. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. But I, I think that's a good question for, for our friends on the ASP.NET team like Dan Roth and Glenn Condren. Right. How yeah. can we trigger this, you know, our Razor templates for MVC Razor pages? Right. How do, right. How do those compiler directives carry through? And I, I would assume that, that it's fine, but uh, but you should definitely have one of them on. I know we're going to be talking about Blazor uh, at Dev Intersection, so oh, yeah. I'm sure that you've got some folks you can bring on with that. Oh, yeah. yes. For sure. Dan, and Dan's always a great, a great oh. interview. He, um, he is. He's fantastic. Great guy, too. So, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I started down a track I kind of want to finish here, which is that yes. if you're looking at adding Nullable to an existing application, it's either such value that you want to go ahead and do that, or it's kind of new in its life cycle, and so you want to add this feature. What I would suggest you do is start with your innermost libraries. So, the the whatever you have for utility library, um, and you can see that simply through your dependencies. So the things that, that are depended on more than dependent. Uh, right. So those, the reason for that is that you, you're going to uh, not have as much, you're gonna have incoming things that need to know whether you're returning nullable, whether you're accepting nullable. But you're not gonna have so many calls out to something where you have no idea what's coming back. There's actually three states that a uh, that a, a variable or a parameter can be in. Sorry. Which, <laughs> whoa, which are uh, null, nullable, not nullable, or what's called oblivious, which means we have no clue. You know, it's really the the term oblivious. And if something is not annotated, then it comes in as oblivious. So as you start your application, if you start at the center then you'll reduce the number of places that you're dealing with oblivious. So uh, you will still see it when you call out to framework classes that are not yet annotated. But oblivious sort of gets in the way of fully implementing the feature. Um, oblivious just doesn't give warnings. It just says, yeah, no clue, We're, we won't bother you on this one. Um, right. So that's the direction I suggest people go, is that start at your central most, you know, look at your dependency graph, or, or if you may already know it, Say that, and if possible, something small so that you can uh, kind of get the hang of it early. Of I'm but sorry. Also, I, I would think a utility class of some kind. Which it's is a utility, also, yeah. When you get a null reference exception calling down into that, those are the toughest ones to debug, right? That's You're true. a long way from the UI action that raised that error. That's absolutely so, true. You know, if I can defeat that stuff, at that utility level, it's really going to make a difference in reliability. Right, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's often those are shared and mm -hmm. across applications. And yeah. so you also are setting yourself up for success across a lot of different places. So yeah. I think it's, a, it's by far the best place to start, certainly what we recommend. suppressed by attacking that versus right. starting anywhere else. Exactly, exactly. And then you can look at things like maybe some data classes if you have some data classes and looking at, um, that helps you understand the definition of what you're doing and it's part of the communication. So if you have a data class with a last name, first name and middle name, you know that's an, a, a good place to go early as well uh, because you're communicating the core of your application by doing this. Right. Um, and then you know, it, it does, it just tracks through and it's a totally, uh, it, it goes everywhere. This feature, by the time you fully implement it, it's, it's changed your entire code base for right. the, the places that you use it. So we're sure. certainly excited about it uh, as, the, as the next great thing for, uh, for C Sharp. I, I don't want to spend all of our time on nullable reference sites, even though it's like, it was absolutely the elephant in the room, we have to go there. Yeah. But there's so many other things happening in C-sharp 8. I think it's one of the most important versions of C-sharp ever. 
I think it is a very important version of C sharp. My gosh, we have so many great versions out there now. Uh, but I think it's going to go down as one like uh, like the uh, you know like async or link. Um, and it, it has another feature that I actually think is going to be a um, uh, it's it's going to be a real marquee feature once people start up taking it. And that's actually async streams. So async streams are a way to easily manage incoming data, uh, which is something that, especially with improvements to SignalR and things, I think that we may be doing uh, a bit more. But it allows you to just wait. And so your for each loop can just wait. And the great thing about this is it kind of is the best of uh, reactive along with the best of synchronous loops. Mm -hmm. So you have this very simple synchronous looking loop. And the problem that reactive could occasionally have is that the data was coming in too fast and it couldn't be processed fast enough. So uh, async streams will wait for either the next piece of data or to finish the things that needs to be done. So if you have data that's coming in and then your operation on that is slow, that's fine. It's going to wait once to get the data, and then again, let's say you're putting in a database, and then it's going to wait again to go in the database. And that's with a really super straightforward code. Um, the actual example in what's new in C Sharp 8 has just got an await in it. Um, but if you explore some of the examples, you're going to see a lot where you're reaching out to a database. You get some data in, and then you reach out and do some calculations and then stick in a database. That is a really good uh, scenario for async streams. So I think that's going to change the way people do their code uh, in, in a certain set of parts. the proposed feature for C Sharp? Like I remember the proposal coming in for it. I'm sorry, for which? For async streams. I, yeah, I, async streams are in C Sharp 8. They are. So they, they oh, didn't yeah. make, but I yeah. remember earlier in the year they were like, they were a proposed thing. But I, I did, were they proposed externally, like, or was that the team that, that wanted that? Uh, I think the team wanted that. They may have also, it may have been requested uh, from the outside, but uh, certainly it's, uh, it, the, the team has been working on this one. So it's, uh, yeah. It's cool. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, it's, it, it's interesting to just think in terms of reactive used to be this sort of side piece that we, we installed and ran separately because you were dealing with the velocity data and you, and you just wanted to, you didn't want to have to store everything. Uh, and right. now it's kind of getting mainstream into C Sharp and, and arguably better. Right, right, right. There's, in, it, as somebody who's building and doing interactions with TCP clients, um, because I'm working on chatbots and those types of things here on Twitch, where I've got that TCP connection open and I'm listening and I'm sending text back and forth, to be able to do that asynchronous listening over the over that TCP socket is actually pretty handy. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's something that's going to help me scale that a lot better in the long run. Yes. 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 So absolutely. So uh, the, the syntax is going to be a wait for each. And so uh, you can... Uh, you can look that up, check it out, and I think that's a really big one. Um, in terms of some other things that's new, uh, people have been asking for the using, uh, using declarations for a while. Right. Um, I think that that is, so instead of having a using block, which requires that you have an, an we've gotten very uh, sensitive to the depth of nesting that we have in our code. Mm -hmm. And the using statement used to add an extra level of nesting in order to uh, to protect a particular variable and ensure that it's disposed. Well, that's great, except that if the end of that block is the end of the method, then the block wasn't really necessary. You could, if you declare at the point of the using, which you do, and then you leave the method after you close the block, there was no real need to have a block. And so for that scenario now, you can just put using on the declaration. Can we, and you will not have to do a block. Can we show that real quick in Visual Studio? Should be able to. Let me see. Let me get back over there. So uh, let's see. We'll move. I'm going to move nullable reference back up to the top where I think in this sample it belongs. Uh, get that out of the way there. And then uh, we'll kind of make this look a little bit normal. Uh, do a couple of changes there. Uh, 
There we go. And I even got okay. us on the side there so folks can see our smiling great. faces. Great, nice. great, great. So uh, let's see. Let's do um, uh, what is a um, – I'm trying to think of something that we can create. I, I tell you what, let's just create. Try while you're writing that, I'll just put right. it together a class here that's an eye disposable. Okay, great. And then then we'll just use uh, we'll just uh, do that. Dev intersection thing and it's eye disposable, right? There you go. So now you've got an object there. It's a dev intersection thing. Okay. Uh, and uh, so that should be all I need to do, uh, right there. So uh, yeah. If I don't get any squiggles that says I've lost my mind, then I believe yeah. that that is all you need to do. And now that will be disposed at the end of the method. And just for a little bit of clarity on what we're doing, I'm just going to move that to the top of that method. Okay. Uh, I think it's just going to give a little bit more um, in, in idea of why we're doing this in the first place. I'm just so thinking now, about typing at the same time on the same code window and it didn't, yeah. didn't blow up. No, it's it's all good. Yeah. So, uh, so now this. So all we're doing is exactly the same as though there was a block beginning on line 23, with line 24 being the first thing inside the block. But it's fine to use a declaration because we were falling out at the end anyway. And so many using blocks were actually not just some part of the method, but they went to the end of the method. And so this is just a cleaner way. Uh, mm -hmm. to do a using. And I think that is going to have a lot of uptake. I think it's one of those things like uh, like expression body methods that people just say, oh, that just makes my code look better. It just makes it prettier. And so I think that's a, um, a super uh, good one. Now, um, I am seeing ahead. a red squiggle here underneath, it, underneath this. It says, you must provide up? an initializer or a f uh, in a fixed or using statement declaration. Oh. Um, uh, I think your class is not happy then. Uh, well, no, no. We need to actually no, no, I, new I, this I, up. No, I need. To, you're right. You're right. I, we absolutely do. So uh, that's what we need to do. There we go. Now, are we happy now? Looks like it. And don't you love the way it just tells us what's wrong? Our compiler has become. Yeah, such I like. A, I get this partner. conversation with your compiler. It's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, and yeah. you know what, yeah. Fuel Snibble, you're right. I like this as a var. I'm gonna, can I change that to a var? Yeah, you can change it to var. It's perfectly happy now. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly the same thing. It's still a dev intersection thing. Yep. So using statements, I think, are going to have a, a big, I think that people are just going to uptake them and love them, and that's going to be super easy. Uh, now, another little thing that is uh, now available is to have different, so the, the read-only, uh, read-only members are oh, yeah. now, yeah, read-only members are, are pretty nice. So we used to, uh, um, hang on a second. I am trying to, I, I've used these, but the examples, oh yeah. So basically the, uh, read-only is a way to state that something, uh, is going to, it, it can only be assigned to, and it differs from the uh, just leaving the set off by having more clarity. Mm. Uh, and well, right, I'm used to creating read-only fields as something like you know private read-only string, you know foo equals bar. Right. Right, and okay, that's read-only, right. but we can also do read-only with properties, right? And that's what you're talking about. Well, it also it says that it's not going to modify any state, and so any state. So you can put that on a method as well, and if you put it on a, a method, it's going to uh, it's going to state that that method isn't going to modify any state, and that makes it both more clear uh, of what's going on, and it also uh, is going to help. Uh, Wait, it, it could also help optimizations. Stop the press! You're telling me I'm going to go if I write public void. Uh, set the bar string and this is my new bar here right if I do something like this and I want to say foo equals new bar I can put read only on this okay let's see exactly what you're doing because we want to get the uh, oh okay so that would uh, that should actually give you a warning. Does it give you a warning? Yep. Yeah. So the modifier. I certainly hope it does. Yeah. I would certainly hope it gave you a warning. Okay. So you said this is going to be read only. It's not read only. 
uh, because it's actually changing something yeah. in the class. Okay. Okay. So now if you... Uh, line, does the read-only warning go away? I'm sorry, what? So if you comment out the line that modified the value. It, it should. Now you probably want to have that not be a void because void uh, read-only methods probably don't make any sense. Sure. Uh, you're going to get all technical. So now if you return... If you return foo, it should everything should be fine now. And but if foo, and that's because foo is actually a field there. Okay. So if foo was a, uh, actually, does that? Yeah, I'm getting a read-only not valid. Foo? Yeah, it still yeah, is so going. Yes, now put read-only on foo. So now does it, uh, does the warning go away? No. Because no, you're saying it's quicker it. than me. Although, it may, yeah. although it makes no reason, there's no reason to have it in both places. You put read only on foo, that should be sufficient anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, folks yeah. are saying, is it in the right place? Well, yeah. right if I just move this over here. Yeah, now it doesn't like read only, must proceed the member type and name. Right, right, right. Okay, so we're falling down on this one. We may need to skip this one um, okay. and go on to something else the uh but it, but the idea here is that you are able to state something and trace read only through uh a little bit not as much as nullable but that's the basic uh, okay. idea behind that right i could uh, i could just return whatever here so that it's not interacting with the rest of the state of the class and you would expect that that to i certainly hope that that comes out but i don't know with read only being a field i'm not quite sure why that was not uh i'm not sure why it was giving okay. touching read only string i'm not quite sure why we were getting that warning so i'll have to follow up on that okay um another thing that we've got is default interface methods and i think they're really worth talking about yes there uh, there was why... a bit of chatter about this one. Oh, i hope so i hope so I think default interface methods are a long uh, pull. So we start with default interface methods now. And I actually suggest people be very, very careful about using them right now. The reason is that they're not going to work with any uh, code prior to C Sharp 8. So if you, the idea of a default interface method is that you have an interface you want to add something new to it. Let's just say you're adding a new yeah. overload to this interface. Well, you're going to break anything that implemented that interface because it doesn't implement your new overload. That's the world that we live in. Um, so we, we've been there for 15, 20 years, right? So now what you can do is you can go into that overload and you can supply a default implementation so that if the, the class that implements it does not provide an implementation, it falls back to that implementation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. 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 So the problem is that this only becomes useful when we can rely on the the code that we're going to that's going to implement the 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 interface understanding what a default interface method is. Right. Okay. That won't happen today, and it is actually remarkable. <laughs> how many times this can be a breaking change. So the idea initially was this was going to be used in the uh, in CoreFX, and CoreFX decided not to use it because all of the places they thought they would use it turned out to be breaking changes. So for example, um, it might be kind of nice if a, uh, if a uh, collection was a, uh, in, from, from an interfa interface uh, perspective, that I read only collection uh, had a had a I'm sorry that I collection derived from I read only collection. Okay, that seems logical. Sure. But it turns out that was a breaking change. Oh, so there's yeah. two problems with with default interface methods, both of which I think people should understand before they use them. One is the big one is that older code will not understand it, and you were doing this to increase the reach and people not having to make changes. So right. if they have to make a change and make sure that they're on C sharp eight, that kind of may defeat the purpose of what you're trying to do. So okay. that's so, the first one. So what if we wrote let's let's put together just a quick simple interface. Oh, sure. okay. Right. If oh, like if I create if I create an interface uh, 
-hmm. called I do stuff, uh -huh. right? Simple. And if it has just one method in it, void uh, do stuff. Yep. Right? Okay. Yep. That's a simple interface and I can apply it to my dev intersection thing up here by saying I do stuff. Right. And Visual Studio will help me implement that interface and I now have a do stuff method down here that whatever we'll do something here so a default interface implementation if we said if we had a do stuff do more stuff right and we just add that to this interface well right. we're changing our interface right the part of me that's used to seeing well you versioned your interface you don't you don't change that Right. 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 The part of me would say, well, make another one of these and call it right. I do stuff too. Right. Exactly. With do more stuff. And this interface, I would say, right. impl also implements I do stuff. That is the way we've always done it. And mm -hmm. so the reason, the purpose for default interface methods is for you to be able to move uh, to just have one interface. And then. So if you move do more stuff back into the interface, back into the other interface. Here. And now you need to give it an implementation. So actually give it, uh, um, do more stuff needs an implementation. Sure. Uh, so So we could say, right, do stuff and whatever, right? Okay, yeah, that's perfect, that's great. It didn't happen to take something, so you'll have to, uh, that's fine, That that's good, that, that's enough to show, to make the point. Yeah, So yeah. this is now, legal but if you go back up to the uh to the class. If you go back up, now you'll find you don't have a squiggle on i do stuff yeah okay right where so right if that was like that right it's gonna give me an error there oh you didn't implement do more stuff exactly exactly okay so that's the purpose of default interface methods and there's two things that people should know before they you know jump into this fully uh, deeply one of which is the thing about older code older code is not going to recognize this it's mm -hmm. going to require that that imp that it's going to break those interfaces so uh, it that's it's gonna, that's it's a gonna problem generate error I presume will it generate uh, error at, at compile time I'm actually not sure about that uh, yeah. it it will so because the interface is in a com separate compiled class I'm assuming that that's in a separate assembly and is being distributed then uh, I actually know what VB does I don't know what C sharp does uh, it, it probably would um, get confused by that interface there's a second problem um, which is I, I hate to even say this but this allows uh, multiple inheritance uh -huh. so multiple interface inheritance and now there's code involved so what winds up is you get into something which is called a diamond problem. And I think that it could have many shapes, but the diamond is a simple shape. And so you have a class, I'll call it class Z, which is a class that someone you have never met is, imp is implementing. And you have a class A, which... Uh, well, we've got our dev intersection thing here, right? Yeah, if yeah, I, yeah. Right, if we just, just mock this up to yeah, show what yeah. this looks like. Exactly. Okay. So you need to create another. Uh, this is a Twitch thing. Actually, let's make this an interface. Oh, okay. Um, and it I can be do, another. I do stuff too. I, I do, do some, some other, other thing. Stuff. Yeah, it's great. Okay. Okay. So uh, that can and make another interface. I do some other thing too. And both of those can uh, inherit from. I do stuff. Okay. There we go. Okay, great. Okay. So I have so three interfaces. Now, if we are, uh, um, if you want to go ahead and make the interface, uh, I, the in interface we're implementing be, we need actually one more. Yes, we need one more, which is uh, make it, uh, I don't know, make it I leaf or something. I leaf? Like that? Yeah, let's call it, yep, yeah, let's do that. And I leaf inherits from both 
uh, I do some other thing, and I do some other thing, too. All right. There we go. Okay. So now, uh, if you were to put a default interface implementation in both I do some other thing and I do some other thing, too. Uh-oh. Yeah, uh-oh. And there's various ways that you can get into trouble uh, on this, but because we now have code that can be put into these interfaces, we do have a new set of problems here. So, if, all right. So, if I did void, uh, I do stuff dot do stuff, mm -hmm. uh, do more stuff, mm -hmm. right? And we had that, let's say over here it says throw new, I'm just, so that it yeah. does something different. Right. And over here, if we do void, I do stuff, do more stuff, and we throw new uh, argument null exception. Right. Okay. So this uh. is, yeah. So this <laughs> is, yes. Okay. So, and now I'll make it worse. If this was all, if, if it was all in one file, this would actually be quite survivable. We would just be careful. Oh, yeah. Here's, here's where the problem comes in which is that uh, I may um, own... I'm afraid. I, some, I do stuff, and I do some other thing. Yeah. But somebody else does an implementation of I do some other thing, too. Okay. And I've never seen that code before. Right. And somebody who's using my feature, my I do stuff interface also decides to reference I do some other thing too. So and let me just put they, another they, class over here so we can see these two side by side because you're you're starting to get a little... <laughs> right. So basically what happens here is if they were all owned by the same person, this would be, this would be just a, a little challenge because yeah. these may oh, so be owned by out. different people. Yeah. Then uh, you can wind up... Basically, if, if you add something to your interface right if I start implementing these right now if I right so I've implemented do stuff do more stuff well what's it gonna do when do more stuff is called on class one or class two because you right. have that default implementation it doesn't know which one yeah. Oh, Kathleen, you're muted. Sorry. I didn't want you to hear my cough. So uh, so at any rate, uh, things can get quite confusing here. Yeah. And I think if we use default interface methods carefully, they're going to be a huge boon to the industry. They're going to be very helpful. If we use them just every time we think of it, then I think we could run into issues uh, with this, you know, I... Inter I implement one interface one way, you interface, you implement another one. Uh, so if you go back to where we had the hierarchy of interfaces, you can imagine uh, where the, if, if I put in something on I do something and you put something on I do some stuff base and they happen to both have the same name, then that has to get resolved too. So mm. uh, it, it can, it's, yeah. It can be confusing. And then in the first version of this, in c 8.0, then also inheritance doesn't necessarily work exactly the way you would expect it to. Uh, there's some challenges in there that are going to require some changes to the runtime, which have not been done. There, th so sometime in the future, uh, if you don't like the way inheritance works in those, please let us know okay. because we're going to want feedback in order to uh, actually make any changes there. And uh, we should give feedback in the Roslyn repository on GitHub? Yes, that's Roslyn is, or C Sharp Lang. C Sharp Lang is, uh, is our space for stuff we haven't built yet, so that's probably better for this. Is that under .NET slash C Sharp Lang? Yes. Yes, .NET C Sharp Lang. I'm going to uh -huh. share that in the chat room. There you go. There's a link to... One of those fundamental truths about languages, right? They're, they're only good when they're powerful enough you can shoot your foot off with them. Oh my gosh, yes. That is true. That yeah. is true. And so Six this is definitely switch. one of those features. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so there's a, there's a couple of just kind of wins, one of which is uh, static local functions. So the benefit of static local functions is that I mean, it's I, kind of like a stat. Go ahead. Well, I, can I pause you there? There's a couple of good yeah, questions yeah. in the chat room that to oh, follow up on yeah, yeah. default interface. That oh, I, 
let's absolutely look at that first. Mm -hmm. um, Fuel Snable asks, is there an overlap between default methods and extension methods, or are they intended for different things? So if I have an extension method and I add a default implementation, it feels like there's overlap there. There, there is. There's overlap, and it has to do with whether or not somebody is going to want can smoothly uh, override that implementation. So you can certainly take an interface and you can add extension methods to that interface. That's all of Link. It's all of what we've done before, mm. and that's fine. But then it's it's more uh, it's not as direct to then say, okay, I want my own implementation of that. Um, and also, these are actual features of the interface itself. So it gives you an op it gives you a new opportunity that you didn't have before, where you can actually change the interface, which you couldn't do before. You could definitely add extension methods, but of course they're not properties. So you're only going to be able to add methods uh, to the as extension methods. Sure. Stelzi uh, comments: Anybody who designs completely new greenfield interfaces with default implementations shouldn't be allowed to call themselves a developer. They should <laughs> only be used if there is a proper, widely used interface to add new things. That, Kathleen, that's right towards what you're saying. I'm saying be cautious, and I might not state that that strongly, but I definitely, <laughs> uh, you know, it's possible that we'll have a different opinion. Uh, sure. in a few years, but this is definitely a feature we should uptake with some conservative um, thinking. Oh, yeah. And so I think that for right now that's true. It is possible that we'll come to a point that says, you know, like, uh, you know, we have an interface that has something that really 99% of the time it's going to be this thing. Right. And so why don't we just give people this thing and only make them implement when this thing isn't the, the common case. Yeah. So it's possible that we will come to that opinion but i do think it's very useful to us as an industry that we tend to um because we're sensitive to the way other people are thinking which is a good thing mm -hmm. then ideas like that you know uh I, I wouldn't have put it quite that way but that you shouldn't use these in greenfield uh i would say for right now that's absolutely true that that surprising people with having these just there from the beginning opens you up to such a slew of diamond problems in the long run that yeah. that would be something I would hesitate to do. I don't know how you would know in the green field that you have a common case like that, like you're guessing. Mm -hmm. I do. Th I think that's true. I think that where, you know, I mean, it, it, most of the time I, I think that's true. If you're doing an interface which is very specific to your domain, that may not be true. You may know what the 90% case is, but I'd still be careful implementing it that way. I would still tend on that to say, oh, well, if there is a common case which people should be using, that's what a base class is for. Let's just use a base class and ask people to derive from that for the common case. So I think that we don't want to let go of the good things we've had before just because we have a new toy to play with. And so I would actually agree. Let's make the interface and then let's implement the interface in a base class if there is a common set that we that we want to do. Yeah. And Ultramark asked, is this something we could turn off? I, I guess I, you could put in some, some rules for if it was being used, at least flag it during compile time. So you could do, I would suggest uh, doing a code fix on that, a, uh, a, um, a warning or a code fix yeah. uh, analyzer because, I mean, that's really what analyzers are for, yeah. is for things where the compiler, it sees it as fine, but you don't. And that allows us to have variety. Um, yeah. It allows us to have the feature. And then if people hate the feature, then they can say, oh, I'm going to write an analyzer. I'm going to find an analyzer that finds default in interface uh, implementations in my code and says, nope, don't do that. And Hi so at yeah. minimum, highlight them and make sure they're talked about because there might be a, a case where you do want it, but you sure. don't want people running off doing it for fun. It's it's not just a toy. It's it's yeah. it's a it's a it's a little bit of a loaded gun. Yeah. So. And right, you can always step down the language version to seven three, right? If there's yeah, if yeah. you're okay with losing the other C sharp eight well, features, yeah, yeah. it's kind of, that's kind of a brutal hammer there, Jeff. Uh, yeah, that's too big I a hammer. I love a good yeah, hammer. That's too big a hammer. No, I don't go for that one. I like yeah, to break no, things. I like, I like having it at compile, at compile time. It's kicking a warning. Yeah. 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 Oh, so we certainly do that. Do yeah. we have any more questions? 
Um, there's a comment that F Sharp has uh, extension properties. It does. And that has been thrown around as a possibility for C Sharp. Uh, I'm not sure that it's going to, we're just starting some uh, conversations about C Sharp 9. So certainly that's a time that you could put some feedback in on that, uh, whether or not we should do that. It requires some redesign mm. of the feature at a pretty base level. So I think that it was it has been mentioned as extension everything uh, in the past. Yes. Uh, don't know that it's on the table for C Sharp 9. Um, I think there's other things we're more excited about. Uh, certainly we're excited about the possibility of records and uh, that's kind of one of the big things that we're talking about right now mm. and you can watch that on C Sharp Lang the meetings uh, are uh, Andy Gaki does a good job of keeping meeting notes so if you're interested in what the team is doing uh, you can check it out in the meeting notes on C Sharp Lang it's really very no secrets anymore is there every idea we try not, works we try not to have secrets uh, you know sometimes for you know, there's things like, you know, resource focus and stuff like that, that, of course, there's a company. The business yeah. is still the business. But uh, we try to have that be as little as possible on all of the all of the .NET core stuff. Oh. So it's very exciting to be in open source there. Hang on. Because I can talk about I don't have to worry about what I might say. Sure. Let, let, me, let me rewind here just a second. Folks in the chat room are pointing out records. Records. Can all we right. talk a little bit about records? <laughs> Yeah, so record, the idea of records is that there's a simple explanation of a class, basically a set of properties, and uh, perhaps some methods, that's fine too. But that expands out to being a fully properly created uh, read-only uh, class, a mutable class. And so that includes things like getting a, uh, a comparison, an equality that makes sense for that, uh, makes uh, getting a hash code that corresponds to that equality correctly mm. uh, and then you know just blowing the whole thing out so similar to expression body methods it's it is a shortcut but it's not just a shortcut where the code is trivial that it's shortcutting it's actually giving you a fully correct immutable class which has a number of features uh, in it and so that's what we're d discussing uh, in terms of records I think Very that cool. that Mads put some of that those ideas up on uh, up on stage at uh, Build 2019. Mm -hmm. So if people want to go back and look for the Mads and Dustin show uh, in uh, Mads Ferguson at Build, I think you're going to see some uh, some records with actual slides and pseudocode and what exactly what's being considered. Yeah, yeah, I know it came up at MVP Summit. Yeah, everybody would. The thing is, everybody wants records, but is are we all ready to say this is what we want them to be? <laughs> and so, you know, that has been the problem in the past: is that should it be mutable? Should it be immutable? And you know, that is. Uh, I think that question, at least the team may have fallen pretty hard on the side of it being immutable, uh, partially because that's the that's the version that's harder to get correct. Yeah. And so, uh, I think we're we're likely to do it that direction. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Awesome. Um, before we let mm -hmm. you go, Kathleen, what are you doing yeah. at DevInch? I know you've got your workshop. What's the workshop look like this year? Uh, so the workshop, uh, I, I, I'm doing this workshop a couple times this, this fall, so I, I actually don't remember exactly uh, what I'm doing in specific there. So the way that workshop runs is that uh, I am really committed to taking intermediate and advanced C-sharp developers and giving them a space so they can simply be better developers. Um, and so we'll dive into some things that we tend to forget about. Uh, we'll, we'll talk uh, about a set of topics. Um, I think I'm covering async there. Uh, I may be doing a little bit with GC, not like, oh, here's the basics, but yeah, you know, GC can still bite you. And if you have a yeah. performance problems, you could still get into trouble. Uh, so it's the basic um, game plan for that. And then uh, I know it's in the abstract, the specific things I'm talking about at that version, but it is something I did before I joined Microsoft and I've had a really hard time letting go of it. So even though workshop well, is I, not I'm like hard to blame for that, I don't want you to let it go. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I really like, I really like doing this workshop. Yeah, it gives me a chance. 
every time you know you see the reviews, people love the way you explain C sharp. So, oh my gosh, you know, yes. I, nice I have a good time form. with that. I have yeah. a good time with it. And then I think I'm doing C sharp eight there. And uh, mm -hmm. am I doing something else? Let me look it up really quick. Uh, I think uh, there's a women in tech event there as well. I am doing the lunch for women in tech, and so. Uh, that is a, it's a networking lunch. It's we're not going to have like a presentation or anything, um, but I hope we're doing that early in the conference. It's always the uh, uh, the goal is to do it's it early. The first lunch of the main show. Is what? We what? Do. It's usually yeah, the first lunch of the main show. So the the goal here is that people get a chance to meet uh, other folks that are uh, you know other folks that are there. That you know being at a conference is always scary. Uh, yeah. There's been very, not at this conference, but other conferences, there's been history people have heard about. Maybe they've had a bad experience. And we want to make sure that when they walk in the room, they walk in the room with folks that they that they recognize mm -hmm. and feel comfortable with. So, yeah. So I'm doing the women's lunch. Uh, I look forward to letting people, you know, have a good chat about that. It's just not a big deal. It's in the corner of the of the main lunch area most of the time. And we just, it's, it's a good networking opportunity. Uh, and then I'm also doing what you need to know about .NET Core. And so I think I'm doing yeah. something kind of like that at .NET Conf as well. Mm -hmm. So I want to work on people better understanding uh, what .NET Core in terms of the CLI and the SDK and the pieces that are there can do for people. So that's the... Uh, now, those... A lot of that was very intentional. That, you know, .NET Core is the first sort of showing of the final versions of Core 3. Then we got a few weeks for it to gestate and then we stick you guys out on stage so you can be in front of folks, talk about it again, and they can talk back to you. And get you yes. Well, yes. I, actually, so it, there's yeah. there's Go a ahead, new version of .NET Core that's on the schedule for November, isn't there? Right. So, so it's we're going to have uh, Core uh, 3.1 is scheduled to come out in November. That wow. will be LTS. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd love to just take a minute and talk about the support policy. I know that sounds like the most boring thing in the world. But this yeah, is but important. Yeah. It is so important and it is so misunder I'm so worried that people don't aren't like paying attention to this. Okay, so, so chat room, hang on, before Kathleen gets started talking about okay. the support policy, warm up and get ready to clip this, okay? So we can make sure that other people know about All support. Right. Go ahead. Okay. So dot net framework. 4.8. Yep. It is in Windows. Okay. Yes. It will be there for a very long time. Exactly. Very long time. So if you uh, if you don't know, there is quite a bit of uh, .NET framework inside Microsoft, and it is in Windows. The commitment to .NET framework is deep. It is not something that we're you know we're walking away from. So that is not going to have new features. But it is going to have bug fixes, security releases, like for a really long time. So if I you're happy, DB6 runtime is still in <laughs> Windows and still yeah. patched. And we just yeah. fixed a, just fixed a bug. So yeah. So <laughs> oh my gosh, um, I didn't. But yeah. So yeah. yeah so I want to start there because that is our support policy for .NET framework. .NET Core, and you can look .NET Core support policy. will take you to the web page. Uh, where we talk about the support policy because it is different. And if people don't understand that, they could get a little bit, can, they may not be on the version they want to be on. So we have two different trains, two different kinds of releases. LTS, which stands for long-term support, and current, which means current. Okay, so 2.1 was an LTS. 2.2 is current. LTS is stays in support until the first of these two events or the last of these two events. They're almost always the same day, so I can't say if it's the first or the last. If it right. says on the page, we, we've got it there. So uh, the two events for LTS are, uh, are a year after the release of the next LTS or three years from the date that it was released. Okay, so, so there we go. There's there's that website the, you're like, talking about, the .NET right. Core policy, yep. right. and there's so, the release cycles. Right. So LTS is three years, and then uh, current is three months after the next release. Right. So 2.2 .2 will go out of support three months after 
we release the next version, which will be 3.0. Mm -hmm. uh, 3.0 will go out of support three months after we release the next version, which is 3.1. 3.1 will stick around for a while. and That's, that's your three-year version. That is the that is the the long term version, and so right. we have announced that uh, now I'm forgetting uh, is so six is our next LTS. So six is November of 2021, and so that is going to be so the cycles are the same if we stay on schedule. So they'll be very close to the same. So November 2021, we release release .NET uh, six and. It's still .NET Core, but we may drop the word core. That's a conversation going on. But when 6 is released, then uh, then then 3.1 will go into its last year of of uh, its last year of its cycle. Right. And you're and calling it 6, not 5? Five? 5 is in 2020. 2020. So 2020 is 5. It is not LTS. And then 2021 is 6, which is LTS. Okay. So if you're okay updating, then you should be on current and get the latest and greatest stuff. You should absolutely be there, okay? But if you're like, wait a minute, three months, are you kidding me? Yeah, I need the stability. I need more stability than that. Then you should be on LTS. Mm -hmm. And if you have code that you have no intention of, of touching, that it's just sitting there doing its job, it's been doing its job for a long time. You're happy with it. It's sitting on .NET Framework. Just leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. Just leave it there. You know, it's it's we have I don't think we've since VB6 we have not had a release that we were so clear that we will support this for a very very long time. Right. So there I just grabbed the blog post um, for the the upcoming schedule just like you're talking about 3.0 RC, we've been past that. The GA is here in two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's the 3 1 2020.NET 5 GA. Yeah, six is the next LTS. There you go, 2021. Right, right. So, so I think it's it's super important that people actually understand that. Um, and I've, I've talked to some people that don't quite understand when 2.2 goes out of support. Um, and I think that that's, that's important. If you're on 2.2 right now, um, I would suggest that you be looking at, at moving to, dot, to .NET Core 3.0 uh, soon after it comes out, or if you can move fast, wait till 3.1, which because 3.1 this year will be about a month before 2.2 goes out of support. Now, support just means you're going to get you know bug fixes and security fixes, and I think that's important. Right. But maybe you don't think that's important, in which case you don't care it. It's not, like, it's not like any of the software bursts into flames, right? It, no. it, does, it does keep running. It, no. it does. Um, if, we, if we have a, a serious problem, then obviously you would like to get patches for that. Yeah. But and, if, and if you call for tech support, they're going to say the, this is an EOL, ver, EOL version. Let's get you onto one of the LTS versions. And, yeah. and you're opting in. You're choosing to join a current version because... You're real. You're ready and able to continue to advancing and stay on that faster pace instead of the three-year cycle with the LTSs. Right, and and I think that that the reason that I really wanted to touch on this is that we previously had one policy. It was you know .NET Framework had a policy, and the fact that we now have this dual policy, I think that people don't realize that, and right. they. Sure. Or, you know, and people that are just in the habit of always going to the next one. Yeah. yeah. And we There's also for skipping versions in this. Right. And yeah. we also we still don't want to ever break somebody's app. Yeah. However, the other thing with .NET Core is that we have a we had an impossible bar for .NET Framework for breaking changes, and because of that, we were really stuck sometimes. The bar is still very, very high for breaking changes. We will never casually do that, but we will not have the same bar for breaking changes with core that we had with framework. And that's what we believe it takes to have a modern platform uh, that can evolve with the needs. It's similar to other platforms uh, that folks might be using, and we think it's the right place to be going forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, cool. It's hard, hard to argue with that. And it's also just recognizing 
you know, part of that stability issue was around being fixed on Windows. Now that now that it's a broader yeah. product than that, yeah. these these yeah. rules have to be different. Absolutely, absolutely yeah. true. Yeah, absolutely. So All yeah, right. that's uh, I I think so. Did we get any questions in the chat room? Everybody's like, hey, we knew that. We knew that. If if you're happy and you know it, four point eight. If you're happy and you know it, four point eight. Yeah. Yeah, we do. We we love we love .NET Core. It's what we get excited about. But uh, the C sharp features are the biggest reason uh, that I know of to go. So yeah, very cool. All right. Well, and, and for those you know, uh, talking to folks that are running in web forms or dependent on WCF and things, and saying, well, what should we do? And it's like get to four point eight, because the most number of choices for whatever happens next starts right. at four point eight. Right. And. I think that we've got uh, a little bit different for web forms and WCF. So web forms, uh, internally, it's a troubled, it's a troubled technology. You know, actually being able to do a lot with it. There is a group uh, in the community that is looking at WCF, and so uh, there is a chance that that will succeed. So you can watch that uh, workflow is the same way. There is a group in the community that's looking at that. Uh, the, the community there on that is a company that needs it internally, and so they're going to do what they need, whether it's going to be what Perfect. you need yeah. might be, you know, you have to, you have to keep brought, it close on. I mentioned this in the chat that there's groups like the Visual Recode guys that are looking at, can we build migration tools? Yeah. Right. Yes, there, there are folks, uh, there's a couple of people, mobilizes in that space as well. There's a few people there that are, uh, that are looking at at tools and uh, you know it's it's a it, web forms is a particular challenge to move yes. uh, and WCF it Amazing. hopefully it's not quite as my entire app is web forms that's right. my entire yeah. app and yeah. that's why web forms is really hard for people yeah yeah. Johan has a has a pretty good request here. Can we have okay. Roslyn analyzers to help with identifying breaking changes? So breaking changes, framework to core? I'm not sure if framework to core is one kettle of fish. But oh, if, as... if it's core to core, then I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah. Uh, I we will keep that in mind when we we haven't really done them yet. You know, as I said, they will never be casual. Uh, so if you're looking at Framework to core, uh, the API portability analyzer is the is the thing you want to oh, go yeah. to. That's dot net you. between dot net cores. That that almost uh, feels like it. Any dot nets between any dot nets. Sure. At all. Yeah. The, but I, I like the idea of it as a, um, uh, uh, what's it called? I was just about. It was right on the tip of my tongue. As a as a no before you go or a preparedness. Yeah. Exactly. Package. Exactly. So you can run uh, the API portability analyzer on your uh, framework applications. You can find out if you can go to standard, find out if you can go to core. You can find all that out early. Mm. As early, I mean, it's it gives you a spreadsheet. Okay, it's like oh, yeah. takes you it takes you longer to find it than run it. I mean, it's really super easy and fast uh, to do. And then you know how much of your application is going to be problematic and how much is just going to go. Just and that's get some initial estimates, of, as some effort exactly. estimates. Because exactly. maybe that, you know, I I talk to organizations that literally have hundreds of internal apps. Yeah. And the idea that we would run it through an analyzer and and pick, you know, two or three that had a really low bar to cross, even though they may you know may not be that important, <laughs> but so you can get a couple over and start talking about what that looks like and sort of build up a skill set around it. I think it's a, it's really valuable to be able to to quickly get an estimate of something, you know, bracketing the scope of the problem. I can I can imagine a consulting firm putting together a, a readiness set of analyzers to measure here ASP.NET Core changed changed the way that the startup class configures your application between 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. Just right. run a couple of analyzers, drop them into your application, and have it report next time you run CI. Here's where you're going to have to make changes, right? right. To get to three. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Analyzers are a, a a great tool. Uh, I'm I'm so excited that we have them. Yeah, and it, and it, it's really interesting. And I think uh, that's what uh, Ultramark was popping in. It's like imagine just adding that to your CI pipeline, so that every app that goes through the compiler is just like, by the way, this is trivial to move to three one. Yeah. 
right? And, yeah. and just yeah. so that we're reminded routinely. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not right now set up to do that. Uh, there's some um, desire to make it a global tool, but it's mm -hmm. not quite there yet. Uh, and it's it runs across. It's got a bunch of reasons it's hard to make it a global tool. I don't know if they'll quite uh, do that or not. But right now, it's super easy to download and just run and get that spreadsheet, yeah. and then spend some time with it and find out where your problems actually are. And it's supposed to give suggestions. It's a little weak on that, but you can yeah. certainly try Stack Overflow in other places. Uh, and we've for... also seen that as these tools mature and people have done it a few times, you start building up by like, here are the eight things that are going right. to bite you, and here right. are the solutions for them. And a couple of them are like, a, dude, you really need to think about this for a while. Like sometimes yeah. there's good workarounds, sometimes there's bad. Well, that's part of the thing about all those transitions is that depending on your code, and I have huge respect for legacy code. The world runs on legacy code, okay? And so code that just sits there and stays in the structure it is right now, and okay, it's bad code, but it's, you know, it's getting the job no done, right? No code that's bad. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but during a transition from .NET Framework to .NET Core, it might be a time to look at some isolation, to yeah. look at splitting off additional assemblies, oh, yeah. uh, to put certain assemblies into .NET Standard, to look at moving business logic out of your MVC application and into a separate assembly. So if this might be a time to look at some of that. You know, as soon as I see developers that need to maintain that app, that work is still going on for it, then those new language features and stuff are important and you can put some weight on that. But if nobody's working on that app, you get it in a container. Right. Yeah. The IT guys have a good handle over top of it and can run it where they want to. Oh, yeah. Right. Leave it right. alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And containers also help us with one of the problems uh, from .NET Framework, which is that it does run on the single framework that's on the machine. Yeah. So when you're running it on hardware, I mean, I've actually talked to people that had, you know, that, that spun up separate VNs, uh, not, you know, not containers, but cool separate VMs, machine, every yeah. single app in their organization because they were so worried about the fact that this app's on 4.7.2 and this one needs 4.8, so we upgrade to 8. And as soon as we do that, the other app stops working. Yeah. And containers really are our path out of that for the, the Windows framework world. Yeah. Core is a new world. It's a world that's cross-platform. It's you know we don't have cross-platform UIs yet, but we have cross-platform web, and you know we'll get there. It's a stepwise process. Yeah, I agree. But I think I still feel like all of this makes sense if you're in standard to get to 4.8. Yeah, if you if you're on framework, uh, if you can get to 4.8, if there's nothing blocking you, then yeah. that's great. I I do hear about people that are like back on two or something because yep. uh, the way and you know. MVC has been one of the things that's changed, and it is amazing today. I think they're going to slow down uh, on their changes, but they, you know, three and four and five, these have been, they've been a bar to get over. And so uh, the fact that folks are, you know, are stuck back on some of those, but, you know, it's real. it'll be really good if you can move forward for those apps that you're doing any work on. Yeah. Well, and, in, and if you're still sitting back on two, you're missing a lot of features and you're, it's time to rethink that app. There's a ton Absolutely. of choice there now. Yeah, yeah. And if you're before two, then for sure, because then you're going before generics. And so your <laughs> oh, your types no. were, so two was, two was generics, three was it, three one was link, With and three, uh, four was async. So those are the big the big things that you're missing being back there. And so yeah, those are, are good. And, and it, those shouldn't be too painful, although, most of the people that I've talked to that are on really old operating systems, uh, I'm sorry, really old versions of the framework, they're sure. actually there because they know they have a problem and it yeah. will take work to, um, to move. So yeah. I respect that. True. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, Kath, that was really fun. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good conversation. I like working. About, so we didn't talk about everything, but that web, that blog post will show people the rest of it and uh, soon we'll have it updated in uh, Microsoft Docs. So. Uh, there's a couple of, of places you can look for that. What's new in C Sharp 8 is a great place to go on that. Absolutely. Very cool. Yeah. And that, I loved writing some good. code together with you there in live share. That, that was fun. fun. Yeah, I should have had a little bit more together on a couple of things, but we had fun. Oh, so, yeah. uh, so that's good. Well, All right. Good. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys at Dev Intersection, and oh. I hope that some of the folks watching will be able to join us there. And 
uh, I hope everybody has a great day. Very cool. All righty. We'll catch you later, Kathleen. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Um, oh, and then we just the two of us. Just the two of us. There we go. <laughs> All right. I, I love I love writing code with somebody who actually uses the language. Like, not just uses the language, but builds the language, you know? Yeah. Well, she's, I mean, I've known Kathleen now for uh, part of 20 years, and she's always been a language junkie. One way or the other, loved uh, uh, code generation and things like that. But it's interesting, these these last few years, actually being a part of the C-sharp team. Yeah. And, uh, it's been a big deal. And now, I think a dream come true for her, that she really fits into the team and is enjoying herself. But also that um, that she's having an influence over the the modern version of language. She's helping yeah. to, to take it forward. She's she's got so much real world experience, right? That's and it, we we can't undervalue that enough, right? There's there's folks mm-hmm. that work on the language team that have only ever worked on languages. Yeah, but sure. to bring someone who's Ben Torgerson's entire career has been C sharp is a reason he leads that project. Yeah, but uh, but he's only ever worked there. So to bring that real world insight in, right? Implementation and feeling those those weird edges of the of the language is so valuable for the team. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it is very powerful stuff. Um, All right. What do we got, my friend? How you? How is he? How we? How do you feel about this first session? This was pretty good. I think we. Miss any questions there. I, I had a couple rough edges here and changing scenes where I was missing. Listen, I, for, you've got to carry over the sound device yeah. over to everything but i got it all set up we got, we're all set there building that that scene the video on the fly with the uh with visual studio that was great i i love actually doing that with folks you know right. okay you're talking about this thing let's actually do it yeah now yeah, and uh, and this sharing is really powerful when you're both typing at the same time it's like now nah, i'm not going to add a third set of hands to that that's nuts oh my god <laughs> it becomes crazy yeah so we're going to do this again every week leading up to the event. Yeah, pretty much. I think we'll, we're going to finish it on Halloween because that's hilarious. Oh, my gosh, yes. Uh, although next week's show is actually on the Friday because who doesn't want to do a Friday the 13th show? And if you're going to do Friday the 13th, you're, you're going to tempt fate on Friday the 13th. <laughs> who can you bring on to create enough havoc? Uh, Quite like. <laughs> machine himself, yeah. Yes, our friend Mark Miller, who has his own crazy live stream and is a remarkable coder and has been for decades, is going to join us next week on Friday the 13th. That is a lot of fate tempting right there. No, we're not having John Skeet join us. No, no. Oh, that'd be fun. I can't get Skeet to come to Vegas. He really, really doesn't like Vegas. Mm. Really, really. And it's a long way for him, you know. He's in the UK. He went. He he. I can. You can get him to shows in the UK once in a while, and he'll uh, sometimes do a jaunt in the Europe. But he rarely sets foot in the North American conference. Oh yeah. There's only certain things. Maybe we can get him to come to Orlando. Yeah, that's easier. We could try. Uh, hmm. I have. <laughs> I've had him crash a humanitarian toolbox coding session. <laughs> that we were oh, there we on. go. I had a bunch of volunteers working on a Nota a, a code, a Nota time implementation in a project, and yeah. they were struggling with the problem. And I literally pinged John and said, "Is there any chance you can just absolutely?" And he just showed up, worked with them for a half hour, fixed wow. everything, zipped back out again, and literally the next message once he was gone was from one of the guys who goes, like, "Is that really John Ski?" <laughs> No, really, yeah. nobody else can do that. It has to be Chotsky. Yeah. Um, yes, Mark Miller is code rushed on Twitch here. That's him. Yeah. So he's another member of the Live Coders group. Uh, I, I would not be surprised if we're writing some code together with Mark. And sure. uh, I don't know I if he's going to. You know, the guy wrote Code Rush for a reason. He likes to code at the speed that he thinks, and he thinks really fast. Oh my gosh, yes. And uh, and yeah, again, I've known him for for more than twenty years, so. Back when he was an Adelphi guy, the original version of Code Rush, written for Delphi. Yeah, it, the great thing that I, I I love talking to him about, and I'm sure it's going to come up next week, is all the things around user interface. How we can make our user interfaces make so much more sense to our users. I've got him in for the three back-to-back sessions. I should spread out a little bit at the conference on the science of great UI. And it's just, it needs to be three hours. Like, there's just no other way. He yeah. thinks so deeply about how color and contrast and 
and placement and animation work. It, it takes a while to get through it. And or you can he's got a workshop version. You want to do a whole day with him? Here's a whole day. Absolutely. It's a lot. But you will think differently about UX after you spend some time with Mark. You, uh, there's no other way. Absolutely. There's a question if we're going to do any Xamarin streams leading up to Dev Intersection. That's a really interesting question. And we don't have a lot of Xamarin content. I'm not saying we don't have any uh, because we don't get a lot of traction from it. You know, I, our show is pretty wide and, and deep as it is. And, uh, you know, we're, we're focusing a lot on the AI topics now as well. I've got the Google guys coming out. We're doing a bunch of Angular. Nice. Again, so it's like you got to figure out what you can fit in. If people push for more Xamarin, like I love James Bond and Magno, and I can put together a pretty good team. There's a, I know there's a couple of sessions there, but I haven't got anything scheduled right now. But, you know, we haven't actually settled all the guests for all of the live streams yet. So we can right. be persuaded. We can make something happen. So. Well, I'm, I got this portal rig working because one of the stops that I'm going to do, I'm going to be in New Zealand on the family farm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know what would be funny? Streaming from New Zealand. You know, let's uh, let's stress the limits of the internet and see how it works out. So I did um, that a few weeks away. I did that a few weeks ago with folks from Raygun. Oh yeah, because right, JD T Trask is down in in Auckland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was they're, great. They're uh, they're putting one of the CDN endpoints and Express Route endpoints into Auckland in the next few months for Azure. So Ooh. yeah, that's that's important. That's like, big. Be, Tough to justify a data center in New Zealand. It's only a country of five million people, but to get one of those, you know, the you think about Microsoft putting new CDNs in all over the world to so that you can, as an Azure customer, take advantage of that. But the side effect of that is these very big, fast, low latency pipeline connections, and you can get access to those through Express Route. Like yeah. I, it just occurred to me that we've leveled up that business now because what you need to be able to run a CDN means you also get to offer these additional services. Yeah. That's, That's exciting. Great stuff. And, it and, is. You know, years ago, I was born in New Zealand for those who don't know, and I talk about it every so often. And years ago, the, the government actually attempted to repatriate me as a technology person. They're like, Hey, we need more technology people in the country. You're already a citizen. Like we'll pay wow. for your twenties. And I said, no, <laughs> Because back, and back then it felt like that, that you know that was going away from technology. It's a it's yeah. a quiet country, and it's still the end of the internet. It There's is only squires off those islands, one to Australia and one to San Francisco. <laughs> That's it. You need to improve that. Well, and these when you see these backbone things coming in from companies like Microsoft, it's like ah, I have faith. Anyway, yeah. we'll have fun. That's in in October. We'll do that one. But next week, Mark Miller, and then the week after that, I think you have Mr. Hanselman. But you I don't do. me. No, <laughs> we're going to be joined by Carrie Payette there to help uh, co-host. That's going to be it. Uh, I, oh, yeah. I I hope I'm, I'll have, I'll watch the YouTube of that because I'm traveling that day, but uh, and, I'm sure it'll be fantastic. And we might be able to do that last Thursday this month from TwitchCon. Yeah, that's you're going to be in San Diego, yeah. and you got Zoin on board. Yeah, so right. it might just be Zoiner and I talking about artificial intelligence, talking about Twitch, but we think we can do something from TwitchCon. Oh, well, or at least good. nearby. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll be in an interesting state. That's a, that's a lot of, uh, of caffeinated beverages in that, that, those couple of days for you, I'm sure. Oh my gosh, yes, because I come right off of doing the 24 hours of .NET Conf. Oh my goodness. Yeah, dude. Every time I think about my like, I've got basically a solid month of travel, but I get to sleep at night even if my <laughs> around. This streaming for twenty four hour thing, this is not easy. Like that is hard. It's work. it's not, but it is. It, right, yeah. we've got multiple hosts, so we're going to rotate. But yeah, I'm on good. call effectively. <laughs> well, if something goes wrong. You are the expert, for better or worse. Yeah. yeah. So all, all right. right well, That's there goes show. our first one of fall season. I'm really happy with it. That's, that was a ton of fun. I hope oh everyone enjoyed it. Oh, my gosh, yes. You, you know what? Should we take a look? Let me take a quick peek here and see if there's anybody that we want to raid that we can. Because I, th I think, I know as a matter of fact, that our friends from Twitch Dev are starting up their show in just a little bit. Um, I can tell a couple of stories while you're getting that set up. You know what? You know who we can rate? Actually, who's ready to be rated? Mark Miller. 
Let's go raid Mark because we're going to raid him back tomorrow or next week. Uh, like, we're literally going to have him on. I'm going to set up. Let's raid Mark Miller. There's the raid call. They, I don't have a raid call. You don't have anything to write out there. But we're going to raid Code Rushed. If you're interested, yep. if you want to see us next week, first off, click the follow button up there. It's just above Richard's head. If you ha aren't following yep. Dev Intersection, follow us so you know when we're coming online. Um, but get ready to say hi to Mark Miller. The Mark Miller. The All right. Mark Miller. So... Thanks so much, everybody. We're going to have this recorded. It'll be available probably on the Dev Intersection website and YouTube channel a little bit later. Yep. So get ready to say hi to Mark, and we'll see you next week, Friday, same uh, about the same time. All right? Yeah. Take care, everybody.